Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 20th anniversary season of the largest championship for IT specialists in Europe, Dev Challenge. Dev Challenge is a development championship for developers, testers, and designers that has been considered the largest European IT competition since 2012. Over 19 seasons, more than 25,000 CE IT professionals have participated. As part of the championship, we let IT specialists work on socially significant tasks. In this way, we not only help IT specialists with their growth, but we also help social and government projects. This season, most of the tasks the participants will work on will be related to social IT solutions to help Ukraine in its post-war reconstruction. The sources of the task will be UNICEF, the Ministry of Veterans Affairs, the Center for Civil Liberties, and others. Now you are joining our online event as part of the Jubilee Season Dev Challenge, Dev Cycle Day. This is a series of six online speeches covering all stages of the development cycle, including the birth of an idea, the development process, and much more. Leading experts and Dev Challenge judges will be present to share their knowledge and experience and will be happy to answer questions from the audience. The YouTube chat of the broadcast is open to your questions. My name is Yana. I'm the project manager at the Ukrainian Startup Fund, and it's my pleasure to moderate the 20th anniversary season of Dev Challenge. Now, let me introduce our agenda for today and fantastic speakers who will dive here in all the stages of the development cycle. Natalia Filvarova, a researcher at Google, will share insights on a topic that is essential for everyone, from spark to start, turning your ideas into products. Alp Turgut, creative director at Artix Design Studio, will tell us about principles of a designer. Ruslan Shevchenko, Researcher and system architect will introduce us to the relative new te techniques in backend programming, durable execution. Then we're going to have 15 minutes break, and then Alexei Astapov, test automation sub practice leader at InfoPulse, will cover the topic shift to the left. Arnika Hryshko, QA chapter lead at Volva Group, will explain us how quality is everyone's responsibility. And then Roman Kipchuk, QA practice lead at Ingenica will introduce test management on real cases. We will have five minutes for the QA session with the speakers after each topic. The YouTube chat of the broadcast is open to your questions, so we are looking forward to them. And now I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Natalia Filvarova, UX researcher at Google. Natalia Filvarova is a UX and product specialist driven by empathy and data, data, building products from scratch, leading young teams and driving communities. She's an active speaker and lecturer at events and companies such as HelloFresh, DevPro, University of Oxford, and at Scientist. Natalia will cover the topic from spark to start, turning your ideas into products. Natalia, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, so I'm ready to Thank start you. whenever. Yeah, sure, you may start. The floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you very much, Yana. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to start with a typical um, you know, online step. Let me share my screen, and I hope that you can all see that. If you can't, I hope the organizers will let me know. So uh, today we're going to be talking about from spark to start, turning your ideas into products. Um, really briefly about myself, I'm Natalia. I have a background in experimental psychology and neuroscience. Um, as Yana mentioned, I love building things. I've built startups, nonprofits. Uh, I've done some academic research before. I've done product manager, and currently I'm a researcher at Google. Um, and I just love building stuff. And, you know, I'm really excited to share with you what my process is to get something from an idea phase to actually something that works. And I hope that you will get a few useful things from this talk. So today we'll be talking about the following things. We'll start with idea generation. We'll discuss briefly uh, where ideas come from and how you can compensate when you're missing some of the space elements. 
We'll then talk about building foundations through research, making sure that your idea has a solid foundation before you know it gets to the next stage. We'll then talk about conceptualizing your ideas and so making them a little bit more clear, a little bit more visible, all the way through to refining, prototyping, and testing. And finally, we'll have five minutes at the end for your Q&A. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with idea generation. Um, when I was preparing this talk, I really wanted to find some statistics uh, sort of, you know, to share with you because I love numbers amongst other things. And I found a fascinating data point that I had never encountered before that I thought was perfect for this. And here it is. Apparently, according to academic research, less than 6% of official ideas. Now, official, we mean ideas that you actually bring up in your company to your management or to somebody else. So ideas that are voiced actually become a success. Less than 6%. Now, you know for yourself how many of the ideas that you have in your head you actually bring outside to make them official. So the reality of the ideas that you have in your head and what actually becomes a success, a commercial success, is probably significantly lower than that. And this number really stuck with me because I feel like if we actually did a lot of the things that I'm hoping to convince you to do throughout the next 30 minutes or so, we would have a higher percentage of ideas that become a success. So... Let's talk about that. Usually, when there is an idea that comes in our mind, um, it comes from one of the three places in a business context. It can come from either markets and trends, from user needs, or from gaps. And we'll talk in a little bit more detail about each one of those right now. So markets and trends refer to things like, for example, technological trends. So, you know, there is now a boom for AI. So we might have an idea for a product that's like, I'm going to slap AI on this thing. You know, I'm going to implement AI in this product. This might be an idea. Uh, we had the same with, you know, VR, data, blockchain, you name it. Every season there is a new buzzword and we feel like we need to build something new that has that buzzword in it. It can also be trends in design, for example, minimalism or flat design or whatever else that might be. And if you way, maybe it's going to be better. You might also have consumer trends that influence and spark your ideas. So this is things like, for instance, remote work. When COVID started and we all went remote, a million products appeared that help us with remote work. It can be things like, you know, many people going vegan recently. So we have a rise in vegan products. So one way in which ideas are generated is through market trends. Another way in which ideas are generated is user needs. For example, you might notice that there is a functional requirement that somebody has, such as somebody needs to get from point A to point B, and you have an idea that, oh, I could actually help them get from point A to point B. It could be emotional needs. So maybe you notice, keeping in the topic of getting from point A to point B, maybe you notice that people have a need to feel safe or confident on their way, and you have an idea to solve that particular problem. Maybe there is a social need. People want to know, uh, you know, for their family to know where they are. So you notice an idea there. So this is user needs. And finally, there is needs. But this is essentially when you notice a market gap and a, an opportunity to actually fix those. So this could be something that you understand is not on the market right now, but you clearly see a need for it. It's an opportunity to very often innovate on existing products. Um, and make them a little bit better. For example, you might do market analysis, sort of like evaluate what exists out there and notice that there is a particular need that is not being solved based on the market. You might do some comparative analysis of different products and services and realize that one of them has something and the other one doesn't, and maybe you want to fix that. Or you might have user feedback, so you listen to users' dissatisfaction, maybe they're not happy with the solutions, maybe they have wishes for additional features, and so on and so forth. So gaps are essentially unmet or undermet needs of users that you might want to fill. Now, you will notice that these three are not mutually exclusive. There is a lot of overlap, of course, but usually an idea will come from one of those places. Now, this is the tricky part. I feel like that is enough. Well, we have an idea. We're going to just go ahead and implement it because we know everything there is to know. And in reality, that is not true. The tricky part is that you must understand all three trends, needs, and gaps to be able to proceed further reliably. Now, you might have an example or two from history where maybe somebody only understood one and went really successful. Yes, it is possible that you go ahead just on a whim, just on an intuition. There have been examples like that. But for most cases, and for the most reliable cases, 
you will have to understand all three of those. So this is the first thing that I want you to keep in mind when trying to bring your idea into an actual product, into actual fruition. Think about what you know, but also what you don't know about that idea and try to fill in those gaps for whether you understand trends, needs, and market gaps for the idea that you have. So that was idea generation. Now let's talk about building foundations. Let's say you understand where, idea you, where your idea is and where it comes from and what it is, and you actually go ahead and you decide that you want to build out those missing pieces that you maybe don't understand. In building foundation, there is for me generally two main camps of thought. There is market and user research, and then there is ideation and creativity that are also really important to help you make your initial idea stronger. And we'll focus on both of those right now. So let's talk about building foundations. When it comes to building foundations through market and user research, I think there is three main points that one has to focus. Point one is understanding your user. Point two is actually doing the research very actively. And point three is doing early concept tests. So what do I mean by those? Let's talk about understanding your user. I'm sure many of you are familiar of things like demographic profiles or personas and stuff like that. And this is one way to look at it. But really, to be able to turn your idea for a product into an actual product that is useful, you have to dig significantly deeper than that. You have to understand what your end user needs, what they want, what they live, what they dream. Very often, we refer to this as psychographic personas. This is something I really enjoy doing because I feel like focusing just on the demographics, i.e., you know, where somebody lives or how much money they have, maybe gives you a little bit of insight on, yeah, how much they could spend on your product but it doesn't really tell you anything about what drives them, what inspires them, what they want to feel and why they will come to your product. So understanding all of those psychological processes that go behind somebody's existence is really, really important. For example, even though demographically I'm a woman, you know, just under my 30s, psychographically, I'm a huge cat lover. And if we didn't map that, we would never be able to, you know, sell me as much cat stuff as I'm actually willing to buy on a daily basis. So it's really important to understand for every one of your users. getting into their shoes and understanding and empathizing with your users. This is particularly important if you're trying to build a product for somebody who is ever so slightly different from you, and very often that might be the case. For example, if you have a great idea for a product for kids in kindergarten, it's not enough to just ask your kid about how they feel or see on TV how kids feel. You need to go in, you need to observe, you need to understand those kids in kindergarten so that you can kind of be in their shoes and you can understand in depth what is it that they need. So understanding your user in that way is one of the key things for you to be able to have a strong foundation for your product. The second element of market and user research is actually doing your research. Now, what I just said before may have sounded a little bit abstract. And the tricky part is, well, where do I find this information? Can I actually knock on a kindergarten's door and listen to kindergartners play? Can I actually, and how do I find The laborious part comes in is an understanding and actually putting effort into understanding the background of your users and problems. So this means, on one hand, gathering as much information as possible from various sources, and on the other hand, actually getting creative with those sources. So usually when we talk about doing our research, we will maybe think about, oh, I'm going to do a user interview, or maybe I'm going to buy a report if my company has a little bit more money, or I have a little bit more money, maybe I'll buy a report online that helps me understand. And those are fantastic sources of information. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of other places where you can get inspiration and information on your users, on your market, on your product. For example, you can do primary research, such as interviews, you know, but you can also do secondary research, such as reading academic papers, reading research by others. You can also do observations, such as actually go in, like we said, and yes, knocking on the door of a kindergarten and asking to observe or sitting outside in a parking lot and watching what people do, understanding what they're missing. You can even walk up to them and ask them questions. Or you can do stuff like look on social media. One of my favorite things is to go on Facebook groups that are relevant to the idea or product that I'm building and see what people are talking about. You can get a wealth of information from people complaining, 
ranting, seeking advice on Facebook or elsewhere, if you want to understand what is it that they actually want and what is it that they actually need. So doing your research actively and from different sources is going to be crucial for you to build a foundation of the product that you are trying to launch. And next, we have concept testing. Now, this is something that is also super important and very often we forget. We very often feel like we cannot actually test out and challenge our idea until it's in its, you know, almost final stages, perhaps because we're afraid, perhaps because very often there is no culture of failure that is instilled in us that makes us feel scared that, oh, what if it doesn't work out? What if I am actually wrong about my idea? But if you do want your idea to be a success and if you want your idea to turn into a product that actually makes sense, you will have to test your thoughts out early and challenge your concepts. As early as possible is the key and you must take all feedback with great care. Usually what happens at this stage, if you do come to a decision of actually concept testing is you might find positive results. So you might find something that supports your idea or supports your thinking. And for some people that results in a notion of, well, why did I test it out in the first place? I knew this anyway. Or on the other hand, you might find something that doesn't support your idea or maybe contradicts some of the assumptions you had. And very often that causes a reaction of, oh, I must have just done the research wrong, or I asked the wrong people, or they didn't get it. Very often that is what happens. But in reality, when we do concept test, is really, really valuable for us to be able to position ourselves and understand where I am, where is my idea, and how are people reacting to it. So don't be afraid to test out your thoughts and concepts as early as possible, and really try to take your feedback with great care. So, as a recap for market and user research, make sure that you focus on understanding your user deeply, not just outlining their demographics, where they live, how much they make. Make sure to actually do your research from different sources, primary, secondary observations, whatever you can do to make sure that you have a broad and deep understanding of your problem space. And finally, concept test early and often so you can get feedback and be guided throughout the process of ideation and make something really, really helpful. So that's market and user research. Now, the second half of building foundations referred to ideation and creativity. And I think this is as important as doing your research and understanding your users and refers to how do you provide or trying to, you know, map out the product that you have. And there is really three main aspects here also that I focus on. Point one being zooming out and in. Very often when we have an idea, um, at least that is what happens to me, uh, you know, you think that you figured it out. You have this brilliant aha moment. You think you figured it out and you think that you know it all. You really need to be able to step back from that and look at bigger picture. The next one is getting creative with creativity. So it's not enough usually to just sit down and think of different solutions. You need to implement different methodologies and we'll talk about those in a second. And finally, working cross-functionally, going outside of your own expertise and trying to find more feedback and more expertise from other sources relevant for your idea. So let's start with the first one, building foundations. I have a picture here of something called the overview effect. Now, the overview effect is something that astronauts in space relate, uh, report uh, when they, for the first time, look at Earth, see, you know, some light, stars, all of those kinds of things they report having this really weird sensation on the inside that really tells them that the way they looked at problems before, the way that they perceived the world before is almost pointless because the world is so much bigger than that. You kind of physically feel very small and very distant from the earthly issues. Now, the reason I brought this up here is because whenever I think about a problem and a solution that I think I came up for that problem, so an idea that I have, I remind myself, how far can I get to try and get that overview effect? How far should I go from my problem into the distance to try and understand the whole ecosystem in which that problem operates and to understand more and more in depth and maybe even have a shift of perspective of what problem I'm trying to solve or what idea I actually have? Now, I haven't been in space. I don't think many people here will necessarily go to space. 
But what I want you to do is whenever you have an idea or a problem with an idea that you're trying to solve, try to move as out of that idea as you possibly can, thinking about the big picture stuff, thinking about where does in the life of your people your idea fit. You know, it's never just about the moment in which they will be using your app or your new product or whatever it is that you came up with. It always fits into the bigger picture of the world that they are living through. So try to zoom out and understand that world and then go back into it to see how your problem fits there. So that is zooming out and in. The next point in building foundations is getting creative with creativity. This is something I enjoy, and I think it's such a fun element of building products out. It's probably my favorite part. And that is actually thinking how you can get new ideas and more solutions and more problems all connected to the thought that you had. You can Google it by yourself, you know, different workshop methods or ideation techniques. There is a million here. Some of the things that I like, for example, could be things like crazy eights. When you get eight minutes to generate eight solutions or eight ideas to expand on your thinking or the five whys. When you ask yourself five times in a row, why is something that you've come up with important or useful? Or, for example, magazine cover design. When you think about your idea or your product idea, you know, if there was a magazine cover describing it in five years' time, how would they describe it? There is all sorts of different techniques and methodologies that help you look at your idea from different perspectives, generate new ideas that maybe complement and push your idea forward, or maybe even challenge it. And it's really important to be able to step outside of the comfort zone of just saying, I'm going to put down on paper what I think, and that's what it is, and try to push yourself out of that boundary and really get creative with how you ideate and how you generate ideas. So I would highly recommend that whenever you have an idea or a thought, you try to use one of these techniques to push your own brain a little bit out of its comfort zone. And finally, when it comes to ideation and creativity, you cannot get away from working cross-functionally. So it's highly unlikely, if not impossible, that the idea or the product that you have is exclusively tied and can be implemented and is targeted at, you know, one and only one type of user. In fact, even if you're building something on the web, it will always have some design element as well as some, you know, engineering element to it. So it's very likely that there is more than one type of individual that you will need to work with to make this idea one true, i.e. actually make it happen, and two, to make it useful, to make the people who will use it at the end actually enjoy it. Now, working cross-functionally early on is crucial because you can come together to build foundations and understand all the different elements of where your thinking comes from and how it's actually going to live. So designers, engineers, researchers, for a doctor or a kindergarten teacher is if it's an app for kindergarten people. It's really important to not forget to do that. And even though it might sound really superficial on the surface, it is surprising how often we bring in people who have a different perspective really, really late in the process. So try to bring those people in as early as you can and get their ideas, get their creativity, get their imagination to help you make your idea more solid. So to recap, Ideation and creativity and building foundations comes in from zooming out and in, getting creative with your methods into how you generate new ideas and everything that's relevant, and working cross-functionally. So that was on building foundations. Now, the next point we're going to talk about is conceptualizing your ideas. And at this point, you might start noticing that, well, these are not really linear and I might have to do one before I do the other. And that is true. Do not treat them as linear. Just treat them as pieces of information that you yourself can then bring together. Ideas. Here we'll be talking about two elements, visualization and storytelling. And both will help you make your idea more tangible as well as understood by others. The main takeaway here will be, the sooner you get your idea on paper, preferably visually, the better it's going to be. I want you to bring an example of this. So I asked here Canva to generate me some pictures of cats, but you can also do this with your friends or anything like that. If you ask your friends to draw a picture of a cat, everybody will likely draw a slightly different picture of a cat. And even though we all know what a cat is made of, right? It has four paws, it has a tail, it has two ears, two eyes, a nose. It's more often than not hairy. Everybody imagines a cat differently. 
from its size to its shape to its color to its character everybody imagines a cat differently and yet when we talk about ideas we assume that everybody will just understand our idea as it is if it's this stuff with something as simple as a cat imagine how differently your people will understand your idea if you don't actually put it on paper if you don't actually visualize it we know that 10 percent is the cost of getting you your UX and your product right up front compared to trying fixing it afterwards. And very often this comes from the fact that if we start building things without actually understanding in depth what it's going to look like and what it's going to act like, we try to fix those things afterwards and then we spend 10 times as much effort, time, money, resources of all kinds of sorts to actually make it happen. So when it comes to conceptualizing your ideas, Let's focus on visualization. One of the most simple ways to think about it is building different levels of fidelity or detailing or whatever you want to call it. Now, you don't have to use any specific terminology here. You don't even have to be a designer to do that. You don't have to open Figma until fairly late in the process of when you have actually conceptualized your idea. Take a piece of paper. Take a piece of paper. Draw on a piece of paper. What is it? that you know, your product is supposed to look like. What features maybe does it have? What does it do? What does it not do? It doesn't matter how good or bad your drawing is, getting it on paper will uncover for you for the first time how differently maybe others understood your idea from your own, and it will help you actually materialize that idea and take it one step forward. You will sometimes find yourself being unable to actually draw things or write things down because what sometimes makes in our head some sense, you know, because thoughts are rambling, some pictures are appearing in our brain and it somehow makes sense for us is really as you put things down on paper, you start thinking about the different restrictions that your product might have, the different issues or the different difficulties of maybe visualizing certain concepts and all of that helps you bring in getting into a lot of details. So point three that you see here of this picture I've taken from the internet, you know, that um, has a lot of detailing, has all of the pretty gradients and whatever that might be, it might take you a really long time to get there. And actually, the moment you get there, it's going to be very difficult for you to let go because this is where it becomes a little bit final. This is where it becomes a little bit perfect. And you feel like you've or as long as I can, and try to iterate and conceptualize on paper with little detail, with rough sketches, not spending too much time just to get my idea understood. This visualization is crucial for you to know by yourself what you are doing and also to be able to deliver to your other teammates or for concept testing with your users what is it that you're dealing with. So don't focus from the first day on finding, you know, that best visualization, that best picture, that perfect gradient, that ideal Figma mock-up, you don't have to do any of that. Put it down on paper in whatever shape you have it, no matter how rough and how bad, it's the first most important step. And the second step is storytelling. Now, if you Google storytelling, you will probably see this picture. It's one of the most popular pictures when it actually comes to storytelling and design, but also in business and data and stuff like that. And it describes to you, you know, what is the regular story flow of a, well, story. To learn, go ahead, that's fine. But this is not what I want to talk to you about today. The reason I put this picture here is because I want you to know that when you're Googling storytelling, you don't have to focus just on this. You can focus on more generally storytelling in its concept. So what is storytelling in its concept? What this refers to is being able to deliver your information, but also understand your information and your idea in a way that fits into a narrative. Now, this very closely relates to us understanding the users and their lives. And what this tells us is our products and our ideas, they don't live in a vacuum. When you're trying to present your idea to somebody else, be it a user or be it a teammate or even to yourself, you need to be able to describe what part of the story, what part of a human life does that fit into? Does it solve the peak of the problem that people are having? This is often refers to as climax in here, but you also don't have to do that. You don't have to call it that way. Or does it refer to helping them get up to that solution? Maybe in crisis here, 
or when they're just planning what is going on. Think about where does your product fit and be able to actually describe that in a story. So just saying that my product helps people do A will give you a very limited understanding of how people will interact with it or how they will actually, you know, feel about it, work with it, where does it fit into their daily lives. On the other hand, being able to tell a story of how somebody might wake up and come to using the product and why it's important is going to help both your teammates, as we said, understand what you're dealing with and maybe help you sell your idea. But also it will most importantly help you to understand where your product actually fits, where your idea actually fits. Now, very often you will hear storytelling being described in the context of delivering final results. And that is true. That is early for you to be able to understand how your idea fits into the story of somebody's life. I like to think about storytelling as a phase of conceptualizing your ideas, understanding where it fits into the system and how people might feel about it. So in summary, conceptualizing your ideas has two elements, visualization, so start low fidelity, start on paper, start with Legos, start with cardboard. I don't care. Visualize your idea as early as you can and be able to describe your idea in a storytelling way so that you can understand where in the storyline of somebody's life your idea fits. And finally, we'll talk about refining and testing. Now, here's another fun fact for you. Every dollar invested in research apparently brings to $100 in return. Now, I don't really know exactly actually how they calculate that. It's really, really tough to calculate things like that. But I can confidently tell you, the more research you do, the more outcome you will get, the more results you will get, the more $100 you will get. Why does that happen? Well, that happens because if we build things first without understanding and testing and refining in depth, we will eventually, inevitably find ourselves in a position where we've gotten some feedback from our users either directly because they told us or indirectly because they haven't used our product or they dropped out. And then we try to fix those problems. So the key point of refining and testing is to be able to do that in advance. Solve the problem before it actually becomes a problem. And to do that, you must be able to test early and as often as possible without having to wait for perfection. Now, refining and testing for me has three elements. Element one, being able to do it often. Element two, being able to do it at small scale. You don't have to wait for big things. And being three, again, concept testing. We've just described that before. So this is a little bit of a repetition. So let's go into those in more depth. The first one is just every thought that you get. Now, of course, you don't have to do that. Um, there is some research, I think, that shows that we have anywhere between seven and 70,000 thoughts a day. You're not going to test every single one of those for sure. But every time you're thinking about doing something for your product, adding something, changing something, removing something, try to get some feedback. Try to do it as often as you can so you can course correct, so you can really be the most useful and make your idea the most useful it can possibly be. One way in which I, for example, like to do it in my team is to set regular times at which testing occurs. So we don't feel the need to wait for a good idea to be there, but actually have a schedule. For example, you have a testing session every two weeks and you have to find something to ask feedback on. If you have some sort of constraints that force you to test, it's very likely that you will find something to test and get feedback on. So really try to do it as often as you can and get deep into the cycle of building, measuring and understanding, learning, and doing it. Often, very often, and more often than you think, you will not need hundreds of users and statistically significant results and whatever else that might be for you to actually learn something new and get better. You can start with four or five users. You can start by asking your neighbor, you know, somebody you live with, somebody you go to school with on the feedback. Very often we're intimidated by doing research and testing because we understand that, well, there is no way we can get, you know, hundreds of people on board. It's going to take time. It's going to take money. How can you do it often? That's the answer. You don't need hundreds of people often. You can test with four or five users at a time. You can do it often and you will actually get your results. There is reasoning behind it. If you're curious to understand why it's four or five users, you can Google that. Nielsen Norman has a really nice article, but also try it from practice. You will figure it out by yourself that usually asking feedback for five 
users at a time, maybe even a bit less, is enough for you to find some things that you could have made better. So, and finally, concepts. As you see, the title of the slide is Building Foundations, because that's what we spoke about when we discussed building foundations. But it comes back here as well. You can concept test, and you should concept test. You should test your ideas out, sometimes before you even develop them in any depth, sometimes before even you put them on paper. Just run the idea by somebody. Just tell them, hey, I'm thinking of X, Y, Z. What do you think? And gather some feedback. It costs close to nothing. It takes close to no time, but you can actually do that. So refining and testing. Do it as often as you can. Test at small scale and concept test before something even makes it on paper. Now, a lot of what I mentioned can actually be described by the double diamond design process. Many of you may be familiar with this, and I just wanted to put it out here in case you're not familiar that you look at it. Now, this is one of the most sort of, you know, set up and developed processes of building out your ideas and turning ideas into products. And essentially what this describes is very similar to what I just said. You start with a general problem that you find, you go bigger to understand more of the problem space to get more empathetic, you do a lot of discovery, you then, oops, here, to do a lot of discovery, you then might narrow down to a specific problem that you find that you want to focus on, that's the definition of the problem, you might then ideate, brainstorm, create some solutions, prototype and test, and iterate, iterate, iterate. Now, this is one of the ways to do it. It's by no means the only way, and it's by no means the way that you have to follow because it's perfect in this exact structure. But if you want to learn a little bit more, it's a great starting point to get inspired and, you know, figure out those other ways in addition to what I've just mentioned to go bigger, go smaller, go bigger, go smaller, ideate in different ways and actually help you turn your idea into something really viable. So I would highly recommend that you actually look into it to get a little bit more inspired. Here we come to the end. We now have a couple of minutes, I think five, six minutes for your Q&A, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I hope out of the stock, you do pick up some, you know, bits of knowledge and some thoughts on how to generate your ideas, how to build our foundations, how to conceptualize them, and how to refine testing. So we're now going to go into Q&A, and I wanted to finish with this beautiful picture that I generated last night with Bing AI, because obviously we're using that, that portrays two of my cats. So if you ask me what is the right way to draw a cat, I'll tell you that this is the right way to draw a cat, and everything else needs more minds than one. So I think we are now ready for questions, Yana. If there yeah, are any thank you, Natalia. Beautiful picture. And thank you, Natalia, for your fantastic speech. That was really, really exciting to hear your perspective on how to turn an idea into reality. And now let me pass a few questions from the audience. How do you understand when an idea is ready for implementation into a product? What criteria do you use? That's a very tough question because I think... Um, I don't actually personally have criteria or actually, you know what, let me take a step back. If you work in a bigger organization, if you work in a company, your company will have some sort of criteria. You know, it could be financial, it could be time, it could be users, whatever that might be. So your company might have those things. For myself personally, whenever I am actually building out a product, I don't have a set of criteria that I apply to everything, but rather I define those criteria on a case by case basis to understand, you know, what will actually solve my problem. So I'll bring you an example. Some of the products, and I use products here very loosely, so it doesn't have to be an app or a physical product. It can also be, you know, an event that you're organizing or, you know, some bigger thing that you're building. Some of those things allow you to launch at a smaller scale and have very small, and have very small things. Oops. I started by launching meetups. To understand, you know, what people want, does the idea resonate with them? And for me, a meetup was like a mini version of the product that I wanted to launch at the end. For some other products, when I was trying to build out a school, I couldn't launch a mini school. I had to launch a whole school from scratch because, you know, half a school doesn't work. It has to be a whole school. So for that, my criteria were, you know, do I have my teachers? Do I have my agenda? Do I have my this and that? And I work through every relevant together. 
uh, sorry, every element individually to then be able to bring them together. So I would generally say there is, for me at least, no single criteria that I can use. Define those criteria individually for each product that help you understand, you know, is my product solving, is my idea at whatever phase it is, solving the problems that I wanted to solve? And do try to launch as early as possible to get that feedback. Thank you for a great answer. The next question is from Daria kozak -Nichayeva. Do you always follow all the parts of the research or do you skip some when you don't have time? Uh, also, I love this question. Uh, I do skip research sometimes. Yes, I do. But it comes with a huge but. For example, um, I do skip research when I feel like I know my users inside out. Now, it doesn't mean I skip all of the research. I skip some parts of the research. But at the very beginning, I mentioned that you have to be able to build empathy towards your users and understand them. And it is possible that at some point, if you talk to your users, you know, for 50,000 times, you will be able to predict what they are likely thinking. So sometimes if I don't have time or I don't have resources, uh, or I want to move quickly or whatever else that might be, I might skip research because I feel confident in knowing what my users want. Now, I would never skip research entirely because I want to have that check. I do believe I know my users, but I am not my user, you know, entirely. So I might want to double check on myself and get some feedback. But yes, sometimes I skip research. There is another situation when I do sometimes skip research, and that is when I understand that for whatever reason, research might not help me move the product forward. So for example, if the product uh, or feature or idea that I'm building out has very strict legal implications, let's say, and no amount of research will make me change that, I might have to skip that and focus on researching how do I best present it rather than should I build this or not. So to summarize, yes, sometimes I do skip research, but there has to be very good reasons for it. And I would recommend to skip it as little as you can and only when you're confident that it's actually not going to help you. Thank you. Thank you once again, Natalia, for great presentations and great answers. Uh, so it's time to move to our next speaker. And now I'm delighted to pass the word to Al Turgut, a creative director at ArtX Design Studio. Al Turgut is a award-winning digital product designer with more than 10 years of experience, including startups and well-known brands like Nike, Zelanda, New Look, Mercedes, and O2. So, um, Alter, Alpa, do you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. If you're Can ready. Can you see my screen start. as well? Yeah. Great. So, thank you so much for having me today. Really looking forward to talk with you guys. Uh, I'm going to be talking with the, the principles of a designer. You might be wondering, actually, there are lots of things to remember in the design industry, especially if I feel you are UX UI designer, you have to think about it. You, you shouldn't be forgetting about anything like from the research phase, from the deliberate deliverance, actually. There are so many things in the way, and you it's really hard to always remember uh, these things in order to make it an end to end design. So, what I'm going to be introducing you today a way of actually mapping these things, which I'm in your design journey. While writing your own story, you might start to, to remember these principles that you're going to be having, which going to be make you keep going in the process until you deliver at the end what you can accomplish. So uh, first thing first, let me introduce you myself. I'm Alp, uh, I'm in the industry like more than 10 years, have an experience with more than uh, lots of uh, big corporations as well as like uh, lots of startups as well. Currently running my own studio as a founder and creative director and also keep going with my clients as much as possible. So, uh, and I've been also uh, as a, doing like as a speaker as well, uh, side to side, and also mentoring as well to do uh, people uh, who are approaching me through various number of different mediums. So I'm going to be asking you, what are the three common things of everyday things? Because what we're going to be designing is, to, is going to be these have common goals eventually. So first thing first, definitely it has to be useful. People are truly designing things that is useful for a long time. If something I kind of a new 
why we are using this particular uh, application because it actually helps us to it's it's very useful it's not really hard and, you know we don't want to actually solve any kind of problem in our daily lives right uh, the second thing is probably is the definitely is a purposeful. So what we are actually using not only useful but also actually is purpose purposeful. So we can actually finish our goal even at the end. So uh, just think about your know, the tools that you are using currently. Just like using them so that you can actually finish the task that you want to do definitely. And the third one will be innovative. And this one is kind of a tricky because when you actually uh, after these three common things, like it's two common things, innovative part is the main thing because you feel like it, like they're, they're like there are different way of things are doing everywhere, but at the end, one innovative thing actually makes you kind of uh, achieve your goal faster and also easier as possible as well as on the usability. So in this case, we want to deliver these three common things in order to create a product itself. And as a product, we're gonna be the we're gonna be the storytellers in order to create this product with these three unique common things. So, in order to tell this story, we should ask ourselves what are the main ingredients of our sto storytelling. So, the first ingredient will be definitely the audience, the the the, the users that we're gonna deliver this product itself. So we're gonna tell this particularly. Helping them to do, accomplish their daily, daily life tasks and how easy is, is that be so there won't be any problem or frustration over it. And also from the, uh, you know, what a way, what kind of a value does this add to their lives? And additionally, who are the storytellers? Uh, by the way, also the audience is a stakeholders too because we are not telling this story to the user itself, but at the same time, the stakeholders too, in order to make them to do what the, the idea, make the idea is live at the end. As a storyteller, is the yourself you. So you in the journey is going to tell this story from start to the end, from stakeholders to the users in order to accomplish a mutual goal. I'm going to be introducing here uh, like maxims. So Maxim is defined by Kant, as you can see, is a conscious expression of a fundamental moral rule or principle. And uh, from Aristotle lectures defines the story itself has a couple of different elements, which is one of the things that like it has definitely has a need to be a plot. A character that is in the plot is really important for this story. Deem definitely is something this to be there. Diction as well as the melody on it and the decor too. So you're gonna create this whole story in a way that at the end with this spectacle. So as a story, storyteller, you, you might need to come up with something in order to be these three common things that we already talk about. So what we, as a storyteller, we have to feed up from our principles in order to do that. And with these principles, we're gonna be delivering something useful, purposeful, and innovative at the end. And that's where I introduce personal principle mapping. So as a, as, a, as a UX designer, as a designer, whoever you are actually, this is actually my journey and it's actually evolving, coming kind of a book at the end and which will gonna be you as well, gonna be creating as too. So I defined this, I just separated this process as a four at the beginning. And so I can actually map my own principles in order to accomplish these things to create something innovative, purposeful, and also usable. So first thing I call this, but we also we are really familiar in the industry, define the problem itself. So define the problem itself, we have to find the right user personas. That's what we're looking for all the time. We have to do, in order to do that, we have to design thinking, do workshops, lots of uh, kind of actually are and what they are needed, what their current problem are, actually. 
In order to do that, we are using different kind of research techniques, including surveys, interviews, over place. We are doing user research, we are doing market research, we are doing competitive research as well. And as well as, of course, we are trying to make sure that we have a nice five-star team where we can actually debate our findings in order to define what the real problem is. And that's what I call as this as kind of a new principle of mine, always mind your surroundings. So Einstein says, if you have one hour to save the world, how will you spend that hour? So like he replies, I will spend 55 minutes of defining the problem and then five minutes solving it, which kind of explains a lot. So in order to define the problem, we have to spend time in order to find out what the problem is, because otherwise the things that we're going to be solving will probably not going to be the solving the problem itself, which we're going to be losing time at the end. So are we creating a painkiller or cure? Because you know, depending on a problem, we might need a painkiller or we might need a cure. So we have to find out what the current problem are. So if there's a, like a, a big sickness going on and painkiller will probably not going to cure itself, we need going to be antibiotic for that. But if we're going to have a kind of a pain and if we don't have any bacterial infection going, the painkiller will be the solving the problem itself. The next day we're going to be fine, right? So we have to find out what the problem is. In order to do that, we have to dig deeper into the situation. And how are we going to be doing that? So we're going to ask a couple of questions. So we're going to say, what are the current goals of the product? We're going to see what the current product is and how we can improve it, definitely. We're going to definitely always, like I said, always mind your surroundings, not only product itself. Also, we have to see what's changed in the world. What, why do we need this solution itself? And because of this, we also we're going to ask him questions like how that has negatively affected, like, the, the, like how the users are affected about this situation and what are the negative effects of it, how we can make this a positive impact so we can change it in a way. And while we are doing that, we're going to ask how might be questions all along, all the time to define the problem itself. And then at the end, we're going to be coming up a solution where it actually solves the problem of the users as well as the stakeholders itself too. So I'm going to be giving a, a small example of a UX, uh, the, the things that I've done over the past years. Uh, since we don't have much time, I'm going to be fast, but I'm going to be trying to be sharp and clear as much as possible in order to see what I'm trying to say. So this is a two customers. So Nike and Neil were both an e-commerce customer, right? They are selling products and goods eventually. But as you can see, if you want to focus which can actually comes with the with with their uh, way of uh, uh, business. So when we check out the Nike, for instance, we're able to see the top bar has been divided into a couple of sections, like new releases, man, woman, kids. There's a sale call and the collections too. But when we check New Look, for instance, we get kind of deep dive into it, and it starts from the wound itself. This is actually what I'm talking about. Like, it, this is kind of an example of what I'm talking about. Like, if you're going to be solving a problem, it's an e-commerce website, right? You're going to be selling the goods, some products itself too. So let's put a bar there and divide into categories and then, you know, just men, women, kids, and then finish with it. No, we have to understand what kind of users are searching for this e-commerce website so it can help those users so they can actually find what they are looking for without frustrations. So as you can see, you can see lots of differences over here, definitely in the picture, but I'm gonna be sharing with it. As you can see, in the Nike version, there's a kit, it's actually divided, not divided into two. On the other hand, instead of kit, New Look has girls itself. And also at the same time, from new releases, and after men comes next, because from the research that has been done, Men are more related in the sports back in the day in the history. So, but new look is the, the demographics and everything is kind of different. So therefore, women comes first. And then there's also a beauty section where users can actually deep dive into beauty. And not only that, women has subcategories, as you can see. You can actually divide into the important things specialized for women, like maternity, how tall are they, how petite they are. So this is really important in the industry definitely for e-commerce website so that the user can actually find what you're looking for easy, faster. 
And we can check the other one, like luxury brand, like it's called like Burberry. As you can see in the top header, there's a bags as well. And why is that? Because Burberry is really famous of the brand. So we are seeing what the users are really searching for, that specific brand, in order to get the, achieve their goals without any problem. Same thing goes with the subcategories. So when you check the Louis subcategories, it's actually divided into shoes, clothing, et cetera. They're like different. This is also changing by like not only from user, but also from your brand itself, because you are selling sports uh, products too. And when you check out the new look, clothing has more inner layers underneath for women in order to get into more detail so they can actually find the product that you're looking for. And you can actually see more, as you can see, there's collections, you know, shop by department gets into a little bit more deeper as well. And under the clothing as well, you have shop by body fit, so you can able to see some other stuff. And now the bag section is there, like different styles of the bags are there just to, in order to show the bag collection are, which is a, also is a luxury. So we have to, we have to define the users differently from what they are. So to find the problem, I actually mapping with my always mind your surroundings in order to remember these details and continue my work while trying to deliver premium user experience, timeless user interface, and well-structured information architecture. And then I come up with a second one. So what is the second one? Design the solution. So, that's what we are trying to do. We define the problem and design the solution itself. Like I said, the problem and the solution. So we have to find that problem that matters and find the solution that solves that problem. So that is the design, the solution itself. So we have to find, finding the right solution is all about. There are lots of websites. You can have different kind of, them. but also we want to make sure that we've, actually solving the problem solution, not only a solution itself. So we are, while we are doing it, we are keeping the familiar. We are aligning with the brand strategy. We know that, of course, because they, if there's a problem, there's also people who want to solve it, yes, but they also have a way of understanding how they are going to solve the problem. So we have to make sure that everyone is happy at the end. And while we are doing that, we are doing constantly testing. We are constantly overcoming challenges, not only from the user perspective, but art. And if you are, if you potentially, if you want to unleash your potential here, that's that's the place because it's going to be really, like I said, it's going to be really tough. So you have to really be sure that, you know, give your all in order to accomplish these solutions. So uh, to, in order to build a solution that is relevant, uh, we have to put yourselves into your, our users' shoes, definitely. So what I mean by that, like we, of course, keeping the familiar avoids discomfort. So we have to make sure that we are designing the solution, but not something that out of the picture that's going to be making our users' lives so hard. We have to make sure that that non-familiarity is, is the solution itself to make this change, or are you going to be the person to make that, that change in order to change the way of industry. So we have to make sure how we're going to keep the familiar to avoid discomfort. So if it, like I'm saying, like if you're going to be a, like a, a checkout section, if someone used just purchase something, you don't want to actually change differently that journey, right? We want to make sure that they can actually pay and go. That's it easy. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Like we also, while doing that, we have to align with the brand strategy, have the stakeholders, uh, uh, stakeholders to agree because those are the ones who give uh, the resources as well. And they have a vision. They have a mission at the end for their company. And definitely for that, we have to make sure that it aligns with their strategy too, because at the end, they are the ones who are trying to gain money or at least make an impact on the industry as much as possible. And in order to do that, we have to make sure that communication, communication is all the time in there from the development people and from the... We have to make sure that we're communicating all the time, aligning with all of them from users, from stakeholders, so we won't be starting all over again at the, at the end. 
So again, another example quickly I'm going to be showing to you. So this is actually by a subscription company. Uh, we did a big research about like demographics and everything. We find out what the problems are really are. Uh, we had created these nice user personas in order to find their hesitation and pain points. We realized that you know they are sensitive to weather. The pricing is really important for them and everything. So they have some like uh, in order to and the, the main thing at the end, we find out that first uh, people actually getting subscription because they're like big tech going on and they don't want to actually they want to make sure that they can use this uh, bikes in order to achieve their goals and daily lives without even any hassles uh, and if any frictions of getting like a theft. And while doing that, lots of people are not really well, well trained from the bicycle perspective they don't like to do maintenance work too so if there's a problem with it so it can come uh, uh, so this subscription can help them to fix the stuff easily so we come up with uh, nice designs and at the end we actually said that, okay let's let's design something that people have when uh, there's a problem they can actually break down in these categories and they can learn what have can actually have the bike can be fixed. And at the end, if they can't be fixed, they can actually book an appointment so that the company itself can help people to fix their issue. But we find out that this is not real. We, we tested this really nice way. And uh and we find out that people doesn't even know this, like what the brakes are, the handlebar itself as well. So we have to make sure that this actually not only solves the stakeholders' problem with the users, but at the same time, it's kind of helping users too. So we kind of add another way of showing that with nice illustrations, what these different parts of the bicycles are look like. It looks better now, way better. But is this the really solves the problem itself? It solves the company's problem and gives that nice look to the company itself too. But the users were still struggling about what these individual things are. So we, at the end, with the testing, doing lots of research as well, we come up with this when you can able to see the users, like these things in real life picture where the user can immediately recognize it. And it really worked well. So we, at the end, we actually solved all of the people's problems at the same time without the hassle. So design the solution is coming with unleash your potential. Next one will be, is I will say, create a difference. So in order to create a difference, what I mean is specific a tool itself. Uh, we need some innovations, definitely. Just like I told you, as a, like a three common things and everyday things, we have to have an identity of this product too, so it can have a difference out of the way. And also, we have to keep our eye on trends all the time to understand what's going on on the over the market and how we can actually get these trends in order to create something these a different, so we don't actually copy. Of course, we can we can copy some of the things as well. But we want to make sure that this difference actually stands out to our product so people can actually use, want to use it more. So I come up with another principle of mine here. There is no finish line. So game changers shake all routines, right? So successful nations, they have the common thing, which is called solve problems. So that's what I'm saying. We're kind of keeping the familiars, but depending on what kind of a need, game changer we might need at the end. So we don't know we need we don't know what we need uh, when they until they become the part of our everyday lives, right? And also we have to make sure that this particular change has me definitely have a positive influence on our users' lives. And at the same time, it should be visually appealing too, because the the, the best way to market our product itself how it's gonna look at the end, right? You don't want to use something that looks ugly. And I'm going to come up with another one here. So as you know, uh, Jira was back in the days, was a really old tool that still does like in these nice shape has handling the stuff too properly with the job tracking system. But at the end, this problem was definitely has like people is really hard to have, navigate through the layers unfortunately, because it's your typical header at the top. So we need a, some kind of a shake in the old routine here. And uh, and the old research after we did, and lots of testing with the users itself, we come up with a kind of a 
uh, left uh, menu. At the end, this was really hard. Uh, users struggled really hard as well. But again, you have to make sure that where there's a game changer needed at the end in order to solve the problem itself. And after a while, with, of course, the testings and research and all that kind of stuff, with helping the users, guiding them to where they are, and making things easier than it looked like, at the end, this become kind of a, a, a general approach to all the different dashboardings around the world as well, as you can see. So everywhere now is using it from Facebook to Twitter, from Teams and everywhere using the site navigational bar in order to achieve the navigation properly. So create a difference comes with, there's no finish line. And the last mapping will be, uh, uh, kind of a uh, product itself to be used all the time. We have to build some triggers in it. And we have to make sure that product itself is simple and reward the investment of the user itself so it can be something with the growing with. It also can create an emotional bond with the users so it can have a kind of a day in their daily life habit, which kind of forms a habit at the end. So I come up with here my principle called constantly evolving. So athletes get faster when they see the finish line. And like when you see the, when you see that you are nearing a goal, the motivation keeps increases so you can actually finish the achievement at the end easily. So like these habit forming products are simple uh, to provide a relief. Uh, it actually keeps user loyal. Definitely. Uh, and also, keep continuously checking this product itself, like Twitter, because Twitter is rewarding the news perspective and actually it satisfies users at the end. So there are different parts, like rewards fueled by being a part of the community. There are like rewards fueled by information and resource and finishing a task. And at the end, I'll come up with this have a quickly for my one of my designs. So back in the day, Nike Running Club was kind of a thing that people were using for running ability. And with Runner, actually, we come up with a solution where you can define your own plan in itself by AI. So it can be reward your investment while you are running training with it. At the end, it's actually estimated the calculations of how we can actually make yourself better from running perspective. So the will the that comes with constantly evolving. And I come up with another actually uh, principle as well, which is called, you know, don't forget to be your true self as well. And I come up with a kind of a principle. Here. I want to actually say that we need to dig deeper, find the real problem is. And right solution that solves the mutual problem of users and stakeholders is not necessarily complex. Uh, the solution that makes things easier innovation itself Hunt for the reward builds ongoing emotional, emotional bridges. And of course, at the end, don't forget to write your own story. But I say, these are my principles. And in the, in the journey that I have having, I'm going to be having maybe another principle at the end. It's going to come in with me. And I'm going to divide into more to create my own story here. And maybe another one is going to come at the end. It's going to be evolving all the time. So I can make myself, you know, I can use my principle to tell my story in a better way. Thanks for joining, guys. Uh, I hope uh, I kind of we kind of learned through each other today in, in a way that kind of influenced and motivated. Please don't forget to follow me, or if you have any questions or if you want to connect with it for mutual collaborations, please for don't forget to add me through LinkedIn through my website. You can check me. And thank you so much for me listening. I can have the questions now. Thank you, Alp, for a wonderful presentation. That was really interesting to dive into the world of design alongside with you. Uh, so now it's time to go to a Q&A session and let me pass uh, the questions from the audience. So Yuri is asking what role does empathy play in your design process and how does it influence your work? Sorry, could you repeat again? Yeah, sure. Uh, Yuri is asking, what role does empathy play in your design process and how does it influence your work? Uh, so, yeah, uh, my principles actually helping me to, as I told you, the, I, I, my statements actually improving uh, myself, uh, kind of 
as much as possible so I can actually at the end I can have uh, a design that I'm really proud of my work in my portfolio as a designer uh, especially design industry the portfolio is everything eventually so I want to make sure that what I design is going to be standard in my portfolio so it can be mutual uh, beneficial for both from my perspective and the client perspective is felt itself while also solves these everyday products like we are using in their users everyday lives too so that kind of motivates me a lot that but, but whenever i see that not only from portfolio perspective but the product itself actually solves the user problem are actually really motivates me in order to make me do more and actually dig deeper into the, uh, the product itself so it can be better Thank you, Alp. And one more question from Pavlo. Uh, how, how have your principles as a designer evolved or remained consistent over your career? And what lessons have you learned from adhering to them? Journey, those principles were not there, definitely. I have my own principles, definitely, but they don't actually define them as a, like a statement rather than as just an idea that I was having. So, of course, uh, if you start in your career earlier, it's very important for designers to be a part of the corporate kind of a big corporate environment or a kind of an agency in order to get kind of learn what they are going on and try to get influenced by the people around their team, etc. And while they are doing that, of course, these things going to be shaped a little bit more, start to shape a little bit more uh, in, in the journey itself. So at the end, when you feel like you have become kind of enough experience to do a kind of work uh, that can be not only, I can say, not only from company perspective, but also at the same time as a freelancer too, if you want to go into a journey, you're going to be alone in your journey itself at some point. And then you're going to be joining the team yourself. But of course, as a, as a freelancer, as a, as, a, as a person who does a job uh, by yourself too, you have to bring your own signature to the uh, your uh, uh, services in order to stand out in the in the uh, industry. You know to get more clients eventually. So with while that reading uh, design uh, materials uh, all the time uh, from books from uh, articles itself, I just also not from design perspective but also literature as well of course when you are actually feed up from the art itself you have to start with come up with these statements in order to kind of mapping with those ideas which kind of helping you in order to become a character by in your own story and identify these uh principles in a way that it can you can echo you can actually put on your work and create that thing that you want uh it which at the end what i want to summarize quickly is that these principles kind of help me to remember these processes in a way that i can't actually forget these individual steps and actually kind of also not only reminds me what to do but also motivates me to do more as well because there's my own principles because of my own maxims i have to be true to myself and i have to keep going in my road in order to create in order to follow my own principles so it's kind of a circle where right? it kind of reminds me motivates me in a way that that i can bring my the best at the end and keep going yes. uh, hopefully uh right now again trying to make these ideas into book hopefully and adding more uh principles on the way i just shared only four or five of them but at the end it's going to be a little bit more than that but uh, these kind of principles are going to be definitely kind of at the end when you wake up in the mirror, you, rem you have to remind yourself these individual bits and pieces so you don't fall apart in the, in the day. So you can keep going and be, your, be the best of you at the end. Thank you, Alp. That was really great. Thank you Thank for you so uh, sharing your ideas and joining us today. And now it's time to move um, to our next speaker. And now I'm happy to announce Ruslan Shevchenko, researcher and system architect. Um, Ruslan Shevchenko is founder of UA Scala User Group, PhD in computer science. 
co-author of the book Methods of Algebraic Programming, an active columnist for the Ukrainian Developers Community Portal and a regular back-end judge at Dev Challenge. Ruslan, you're welcome. The stage is yours. yet? Yeah, Hi. that's all good now. Okay. Mm. So, mm, uh, I want uh, to talk a little about some relative new technologies in backend programming. And uh, let's uh, think a little uh, in general why we need bucket programming at all. Uh, traditionally, we have three sires, uh, and um, but backend programming is determined that it is situated on the logic tier, so-called in, in the middle. Uh, interesting that um, it was uh, not always uh, no, there was two tier, then we introduced uh, middle wire, and then half of the upper activity is more to middle wire. Why? Uh, why front end can query database without use to bucket logic? Uh, because uh, people know that uh, programming is like it is like moving just on from one place to another, they seal it. And uh, if we will think more, then it is interesting uh, why we have no, we have front-end programming, we have back-end programming, but front-end programming is more like design, but why we have no data programming, or it is very redundant. And uh, why back-end programming uh, became relatively hard. Let's... Uh, think about this. Um, here is a slide from because uh, it resembles uh, PHP server-side pages, which was popular near 20 years ago. And this is uh, regularly the same things. We have, and um, if you read Twitter, you can see uh, many um, reports with sliders um, with uh, some comments about security and scaling, but actually uh, it is not nothing uh, bad because uh, it is server side component, so actually it is a backend code, not front end. It is server side rendering. We can say that uh, it is a front end by uh, it is full stack, yes. We have a source code of a backend client, and we have no SQL injection. But uh, interesting that uh, because uh, the Perl scripts was 20 years ago, but now we have several components, and uh, all what is changed that uh, in uh, Perl and PHP server side was presentation was html in server components presentation is javascript on browser but all others is the same um, and uh, we can see that in some cases we can reduce the amount of work needed by uh, merging presentation and logic tier uh, if we look on the other technicals then we can see that uh, at the same time, exists many technologies to merge logic and data types. Uh, it can be uh, the same thing like persistent object, which was in small talk. Oh, it's error. It's not AT, but uh, it is uh, quite ancient. Um, um, and in uh, yeah, we have later GraphQL, which allows um, presentation 
to query structured data from the logic uh, in, and now we have variable objects. So it is the same way, but uh, make interesting. Okay, and um, let's now think uh, if we have these tires, uh, what the work? We know that presentation tire is a work for user interface. We know the database is needed for character model, but what is the work of business? It's a, a, have to ask auditory about this, but now uh, I can say that uh, talk is straining in one side. Um, so mm -hmm. the Maybe the work of uh, logic tire is a long time behavior logic. Uh, is when we do something uh, and uh, this is not about bad data, but about behavior, because data we have to device for data. And this is not, not about uh, the form, why form, because it's about the large, but something about global. Example, no, red, remind me tomorrow about something. And uh, it is also a slide which uh, become a memo. Programmer sent reminder for, and it was uh, quite funny because we know that uh, program can stop uh, between uh, start one uh, between now and tomorrow mm, and uh, only no wise can write such code because we know transactions we have no such handling but uh, sleep 25 hours uh, but now uh, in the new um, way from uh, in the on the surface technology, uh, this uh, make uh, uh, reality and actually uh, this await uh, what we can do. This we suspend program, store local states somewhere in the database or on disk. next uh, day uh, system will uh, restart our process restore a state and process can be restarted on other, on other computer uh, and uh, send a and uh, such technique uh, this will uh, save this will free programmer from a very big set of problems uh, because uh, it gives us strong guarantee. Of course, we have limitations. For example, uh, we should know have uh, uh, input output here, or this input output should be managed by uh, execution engine. And of course, all of our states should be serializable. We will check, but uh, yet one flower. Uh, we can have some entities which can be uh, named as actors or behaviors or activity where object database and you can query object about uh, status and op uh, about operations. And in this case, we, in some cases, uh, eliminate the niche database at all. So we do if we have object, we can just work with object. And we don't, and uh, the framework with work with our database over the hood, but we don't know about this. And uh, actually it will allow us to eliminate uh, maybe 50% of uh, backend programming work. Mm. Okay, now um, uh, we have uh, many flowers of 
may be. Uh, if we think about cloud offering, it's uh, Azure, cloud far AWS, uh, cloud. Mm -hmm. If uh, interest in the Pitme organizer, I will just uh, send the list of uh, all presentation uh, here. Also, we can have this at home. Uh, for JS in API of NodeVM, we have uh, something like uh, suspend function, which can suspend and execute a function in Node. And it is possible to build a variable computing engine around it. And I think uh, uh, we will send, uh, we will see a few examples of this in the next uh, year or something like. In Crack, coordinate restore and checkpoints, uh, which uh, based uh, on uh, stations that we can say during process. Okay, now stop and uh, persistence themselves. And then later we can restart this number short again on another computer on this. But probability uh, this can be quite, uh, I can say, um, granularity is too big. Uh, and uh, on GVM, we have um, also the other flower when we don't want to persist uh, all system, but we can persist state of one object uh, via library methods and this like actors. Uh, also, we can uh, also check uh, some interesting uh, uh, implementations of this idea. Other things on this is early stage. We have no standards, but this technically can scope backend programming to the business logic again and rework from the uh, such state when we more just thought from one page to, from white side to other into something more useful and uh, more rewarding. It's uh, all what maybe we can talk more about this. And now I am open to the questions. Thank you, Ruslan, for your presentation. Uh, so we have a few questions from the audience. Let's start with the first one. Um, what role do event-driven architectures or ser serverless computing play in enabling durable execution in backend systems? At first, um, its cloud become to us such word of orchestration when we have other processes and we uh, want to foot down and uh, start uh, other processes. And some idea that you can foot down and start as a process, it is from cloud computing. So historically, the cloud, and now, uh, of course, uh, this is the, uh, the beginning of this idea is the cloud offering. It, it is the one thing, the second thing that um, uh, cloud companies, they look how uh, they can uh, bind uh, programmers to their platform, what they give us. And if they give the programmers the ability to uh, eliminate, for example, same to the base or to think clearly, then it is great. Uh, so we can say that cloud uh, is uh, uh, something like uh, uh, engineering which so from the first uh, propagate this idea and this idea uh, created as it become as a part of cloud offering on the this stage of the evolution uh, on the previous second evolution uh, this was the idea of uh, image which was in a, a small talk uh, which was the part of language offering uh, so so yes, but uh, cloud is not, uh, no, it is 
as we can say, uh, it is, but it is possible to do this without load at also. And I think the, or mini cloud on your computer will be the same, uh, will give us the same possibility. Thank you, Rislan. Um, let me pass the next question. Roman is wondering, how does a durable execution impact system reliability, especially in high transaction or crucial environments? Uh, actually, the answer of pass, we have few, uh, uh, the few answers from different uh, um, sites. For example, uh, answer of pass vendor. It is a problem of the, our architecture. We are scalable, it is not your problem. We will uh, raise uh, how many process, uh, how needed. Uh, and uh, uh, it looks like a platform will for a logic. Uh, behind this, of course, it means that uh, we will pay for this uh, and uh, that we will need a sophisticated uh, handling of uh, resource quarters for this. It is the one thing, the other programmer's answer that uh, in general, of course, uh, when you have uh, such uh, changes that uh, uh, each uh, client is like some process, then scalability is uh, slightly worse than uh, in, when you write minimal optimized backend uh, which has millions of clients. But uh, if we will build our platform carefully, then it is also become a framework problem. And in general, this means that uh, the application programmer will not think, he will think uh, in terms of resource limits and will not think about handling the scalability problems themselves. Thank you. And one more question from Max. Can you share examples or case studies where durable execution has significantly enhanced or transformed backend system in practical applications? Um, right now, it's hard to say because uh, we have no uh, situation when we have systems, big systems, then we uh, rebuild it into the execution uh, because uh, it's very hard to uh, transfer systems from one hard uh, from one architecture to another. Uh, so I think that uh, instead we have some systems which build uh, on this idea and some old systems which will build on the other ideas uh, and can crackle. Maybe we can reformulate this question as, uh, can we give an example of a system which uh, built with durable executions uh, on hand? And I could uh, say that uh, exist, uh, uh, that uh, exists a case study when trade systems, but I don't remember now, I can look and send uh, uh, in some chat uh, references because I can't remember the, uh, the names. Uh, but I can say that uh, trading systems, uh, exist trading systems, which was new trading systems, which was built with durable executions and its uh, work. And you know, in the world of trading systems, uh, the latency it is, no, is very good. But it is, uh, but absolutely uh, you can't, uh, rebuild systems, because uh, usually the change of architecture is too large. Thank you very much, Ruslan, for your speech and for joining us today. That was really great. And before we are going in a break, 
let me remind you of the Dev Challenge, that is a development championship for developers, testers, and designers that has been considered the largest European IT competition since 2012. Over 19 seasons, more than 25,000 CE IT professionals have participated. And now you're joining our online event as a part of the Jubilee Season Dev Challenge. Dev Cycle Day. This is a series of six online speeches covering all the stages of the development cycle, including the birth of an idea, the development process, and much more. Leading experts and Dev Challenge judges are presenting to share their knowledge and experience and are happy to answer your questions. So the YouTube chat uh, of the podcast is always open to your questions, so we are waiting for them. And now we are going on a 15-minute break uh, and uh, while we are in the break, let's recall how the last season of the Dev Challenge Championship went. See you in 15 minutes. Dev Challenge, the biggest IT competition in Europe. It's a connection with really inspired people. And to build something that is more than another IT project. To build the future. Take a new perspective on the tasks that you solve on a daily basis. You know, to feel this atmosphere. Dev Challenge, it's time to challenge yourself. And be more strong than you was yesterday. You can meet different startups, different companies, and talk to the people. And networking is definitely an important part of that. Professional colleagues that we can communicate, laugh, and discuss our plans for the future. And a great opportunity to spend time with professionals. Dev Challenge is a good place to check your skills, to find out who the best is and for sure to hire some of them to my team. What is important is to grow and to become better.
Dev Challenge, the biggest IT competition in Europe. It's a connection with really inspired people. And to build something that is more than another IT project. To build the future. Taking your perspective on the tasks that you solve on a daily basis. You know, to feel this atmosphere. Dev Challenge, it's time to challenge yourself. And be more strong than you was yesterday. You can meet different startups, different companies, and talk to the people. And networking is definitely an important part of that. Professional colleagues that we can communicate, laugh, and discuss our plans for the future. And a great opportunity to spend time with professionals. Dev Challenge is a good place to check your skills, to find out who the best is and for sure to hire some of them to my team. What is important is to grow and to become better. <clears throat> we are happy to be back. You are joining our online event as a part of the Jubilee season of Dev Challenge, Dev Cycle Day. As a part of the Dev Challenge Championship, we let IT specialists work on socially significant tasks. In this way, we not only help IT specialists with their growth, but we also help social and government projects. This season, most of the tasks the participants will work on will be related to social IT solutions to help Ukraine in its post-war reconstruction.
The sources of the task will be UNICEF, the Ministry of Veteran Affairs, the Center for Civil Liberties, and others. Let's continue our lectures. And the next speaker is Alexey Astapov. I'm glad to welcome you, Alexey. Alexey is QA test lead with more than 15 years of experience in software testing, author of Manual, test automation and performance testing courses, co-founder of Ukrainian testing blog, QN Mania, and speaker of Joe QA podcast. I'm happy to welcome you. The stage is yours, Alexey. Thank you, Jana. Hi, everybody. Hi. So let me share my presentation. Yeah, sure. Okay, do you see it? Yeah, it's all perfect. You may start. Okay, that's great. Uh, I was thinking about something interesting and special for this event, and I decided to concentrate my thoughts to something like shift left approach because uh, there are a lot of information in the internet about how cool it is to shift left our testing but uh, basically the main issue of it that uh, a lot of these articles are too general and i decided to think about some real practice advice i can give you and you can try by yourself in your software development and testing so uh, actually thank you for introduction uh, i won't repeat it uh, myself but uh, maybe some small correction uh, when i just applied myself to be a judge on dev challenge i just was a test lead in the info polls and now i am promoted to head of test automation practice and responsible for the whole test automation processes and it's awesome new position and i hope in half a year uh, when I will uh, get into the processes, I will share maybe in some conference or meetup or workshop how to be a <laughs> uh, head of test automation and what value I brought uh, to our company. Uh, anyway, test op uh, I want to start my uh, story, not from Shift Left exactly, but from test ops. More than three years ago, I read an, an article introducing test ops it was my reflection on questions uh, who am i and what i am doing uh, appears i did a lot of stuff not typical for a typical qa like uh, small development tasks uh, some environment configurations okay. <clears throat> some pipeline configurations monitoring it's actually a lot of them uh, are typical DevOps activities. And I came out to term test ops. It's like methodology aimed to speed up development and testing by closer work with QA, devs, and operations. I Googled this term, but did not found much. So I've decided to make it popular, this particular work. Actually, in my CV, LinkedIn, uh, test ops is one of my best skills by the way <laughs> i think it's really cool and brilliant idea but during the research my colleague uh, out shift left uh, every article as i saw said already uh they're telling us that how cool to focus on uh, testing early stages of software development and sounds reasonable but too abstract it's like a agile manifesto uh, do nice things uh, don't do bad things uh, be nice guy don't <laughs> don't be bad guy <laughs> and uh, actually it's can be inspiring but how can i implement this shift left approach uh, i need some checklist with particular steps i can do and achieve some results i decided to collect practical advice from my own experience and uh, share it with you and uh, during my preparation, I put a bunch of notes. I uh, noticed that uh, I can group my piece of advice, pieces of advice by waterfall stages. So let's shift left to gather through the waterfall. And the uh, first stage of waterfall is a planning. And uh, I came up with two main specific ideas for 
shift left in planning. First of all, it's a roadmap. I was lucky. Majority of my projects where I was a tester or a test lead uh, person to track if we are moving in the right direction through this roadmap. But appears a project uh, where product owner had a vision, not a roadmap by vision. Do this feature and then do this feature and then let's put this feature together, integrate them. Oh, it seems you cannot integrate them because we need the third feature. And to implement third feature, we need to change and uh, totally rework those two features we already implemented. It's a mess. And uh, I got sick and uh, sick of it. And I proposed my own roadmap to the product owners, to the customers. Said, hey, guys, I know you want everything uh, all at once, but we cannot do it physically, uh, the whole team. So uh, I see the main features you want to have, you want to see, you want to show them to your end users, to your customers. So let's agree to uh, do uh, way. So everybody will be happy. So we won't suffer from uh, lack of integration testing, the lack of uh, uh, the, the, uh, we won't suffer from the rework of these features, and you will uh, see the real increment of your products we are doing. So uh, my advice to you: find roadmap of your project, check it, and check if you are moving in the right direction. And if you don't have a roadmap, just propose to create one. And it's uh, not a good approach just to criticize, oh, you don't have a roadmap. <laughs> Everything is bad and I, uh, I, I'm I leaving it. No, uh, I propose you, if nobody wants to create a roadmap, you can do it by yourself, at least high level and propose to the team. It's a first point to good negotiation uh, to provide something in the how to get things done. It's a complex task, but actually I've noticed that there are a lot of software development projects, startups, uh, all out stuff, outsource. Uh, they are struggling from some issues you never thought uh, it really can be an issue. But in some projects I came out that uh, the development team is suffering that, oh, we don't have continuous delivery because uh, initially, we designed our pipeline to do some steps manually, and now uh, we uh, have a lot of manual overhead. We cannot uh, deliver our software in time, and we don't know how to change it because our pipeline already a source for some other tasks, and we cannot just change it or update it or use another one. And actually, it's some dummy things like uh, what messenger would our team use for communication with uh, internet customers and so on. And all these questions should be answered in advance as uh, soon as possible uh, when you're starting to develop software. You need to decide what software do you need. Maybe you need to buy some licenses, uh, get some guidelines how you use it, what environments you need in advance. Maybe you want to do auto automation testing, and for automation testing, it's preferable to have its own environment and in the stage of planning. So you don't have software, you don't have requirements, you have only some bright idea how to uh, about software you want but you already need to think about some environments for it. Uh, also, risk management is uh, the way you can uh, at least plan risks you're going to manage on the planning stage or maybe some prepare some mitigation scenarios for the future. It's also a really good one. The next one, requirements. First one, uh, each time I am reading requirements, I am trying to not, not just uh, apply test cases, apply some test logic using test design, how would I uh, test it, but I am thinking out of the box how user will use it, because it appears that a lot of ideas, uh, product owners came to us, uh, like uh, they want this button and this button and this button would be clickable. Wow, <laughs> what, what would this button do? 
uh, okay, oh, we, we're not sure yet, but we want this button. Okay, it's a, it's a bad approach just to give this mind flow, give this vision away and develop it as is. Always question your requirements, your product owners, how users will use it, how 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 I will use it if I would be a user of my own product. And uh, these algorithms as I uh, as a developer, not as a tester. So if I see complicated algorithm, I'm trying to implement it with the Python language just to see if I able to implement this algorithm because it appears that even if we have some dictionary with key terms how to uh, should should be used in this algorithm it appears that some terms can be changed or some terms can be missed and it appears as a developer i cannot implement this algorithm so i'm really surprised when uh, i came to product owner with a question uh, i can implement this, but developer at the same time said, oh, I implemented, I, I already delivered it to dev test in test environment. It's really weird because uh, uh, developers try to make assumption. Okay, this variable is not defined, so I would put it just let it be zero <laughs> by default. And it's it's wrong uh, approach. It cannot be implemented. I will raise a question. It's a red flag for me. Another one is estimation of efforts. Uh, a lot of features requested by product owners, by users, by uh, customers in our outsource project, like I want some magical UI uh, where I can configure every uh, step of my work in my admin panel. And uh, I want uh, so advanced config that I can use visual programming for program some workflows in my super duper application and uh, it sounds really cool and we are starting to think uh, how to implement these requirements but then we came with a question how many users would have admin rights to configure this and it appears that uh, it's planned to have two three people with such rights but uh, implementing of such admin screens would take about half a year parameters and appears it's just not uh, not a good feature to implement because uh, for free people we can design even some JSON configuration or YAML configuration give it to the users and uh, they can manage how to do it it's not uh, some broad uh, software for everyone so actually and actually my advice is just be expert you're paid for so as an expert i can say that this uh, approach this requirement are bad and uh, we are not going to implement this because you are paid money to me to be an expert to say uh, the best way how to implement your software and make it efficient and i say that these requirements are not efficient and we can postpone them or abandon them and the same approach with the feature priority. With I know that uh, prioritizing of backlog depends on product owners who uh, own, own the product, but uh, some features should be implemented earlier just because we depend on them later. And it can be obvious for us, but it's not obvious for users, for customers. And we have, as experts, to uh, bring this idea that we have to have the such sequence of development fee of features because of some uh, relations. It's not visible for you, but they are in the software and uh, you have to get ready for this. And uh, on this early stage, I just like to remind you that NFRs are important. Everybody is reading requirements and during shift left approach or during just early QA, you name it as you want, but I would bring some, bring some value, but not thinking about uh, in what cost this function would bring the value, how efficient it would be, how reliable it would be, how usable it would be. 
and uh, good QA, I think, should mind of uh, NFRs and ask how. Okay, let's go next one, and next one is design. Uh, from my point of view, and I'm trying to achieve it in all projects I'm participating, that all action software is doing must be explicit. So there should be no hidden things, no unobvious things, no uncommunicated, uh, some joined actions, a lot of actions in one action. And uh, all interfaces uh, are, uh, accessible by users should provide some feedback on what uh, are they doing right now. You know, this annoying stuff in Windows, for instance, if you are trying to copy freeze for 5, 10, 15 seconds without any interaction and then okay, we are doing something, but uh, you interrupted it already, so we just crash in. Uh, <laughs> it's the uh, worst uh, UI design, UX design pattern ever, because we just can open some pop-up and show that something is doing. And, uh, even this uh, hourglass uh, icon can show me that something is going on. Uh, it's already some interface feedback, and without it, uh, your application would seem uh, bad. And about some hidden and unobvious things, uh, things I face it with uh, some buttons like uh, I want to create user in the uh, in the system. Just register new one. I'm registering it, and uh, after this registration, without any permissions, uh, for instance, I'm subscribed for some. Uh, uh, data is transferred somewhere without uh, my permission, blah, blah, blah. Now it's forbidden by GDPR, and it's luckily that GDPR uh, uh, requires uh, software vendors uh, to show where I can use my data and uh, provide explicit permissions for it. Previously, before this law, uh, software could do a lot of weird stuff. And uh, uh, actually, if you see some uh, requirements which says that user will push this software and will create this data and delete this data and delete this data and modify this one, it's a bad requirement. We should change this. We should elaborate these requirements to make everything visible. So user should be warned about actions a user is doing by any action, uh, by interaction with any feature. Uh, <clears throat> left even design stage is all features must be simple. Uh, there should not be some sophisticated logic. On a bank project I previously used to work, we had algorithms to calculate if a uh, bank can grant uh, give money to a user as a credit money. And we had algorithms for 12 steps. It was if, if, if it was uh, a nested ifs uh, about the six or seven ifs nested one by another. It was so complicated. If draw a tree of this algorithm, it would be really messy and heavy. And I was really proud uh, four years ago, five years ago, that I managed to test such complicated algorithm. Yeah, yeah I am super tester. I can uh, test all of this stuff and I understand how this stuff is going on. And now I am ashamed of it. It's not a, <laughs> a good uh, story about me. Ben, uh, such requirements, such algorithm ever be implemented. I had to demand this algorithm to be simplified, to be split to, to some small parts, uh, which we can test separately and then integrate them and test together. This is a good approach for everyone, for developers, because it's simpler to develop simple parts for testers to test and for users, because they understand that this input put, uh, can be put to this part of the algorithm, calculated and transferred to the next part. It's a, a transparent process for users, for developers, for QAs. It's a win-win situation. Uh, we have to get rid of uh, sophisticated algorithms in our code, in our on the stage of design. So we are thinking about how our software would work. Uh, 
checking the requirements, and if we see such things, we should get rid of them. to design, not to code, but to design. Uh, if you ask your developers in your teams, what is solid, what is dry, what is keys, they would answer you that, yeah, solid, it's cool stuff. Um, it's, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> I forgot <laughs> what solid is. It's uh, open, closed, list of substitution, interface, blah, blah, blah. Uh, okay, uh, they, they know these principles and they are following these principles when they are developing some system small piece of software like classes in their code functions but uh, if we are talking about design uh, they are just forget for these uh, principles and this is really bad approach uh, <clears throat> like do, do not repeat yourself uh, okay i won't create another class to do the same thing but if we are talking about really similar features and what should I do as a developer I will create completely the same code but name it differently because it's different feature it, it would be okay for me and I saw a lot of such stuff and uh, actually it's really bad approach like kiss it's uh, uh, keep it simple and stupid so if we are talking about some functions and classes developers try to keep them simple and stupid but we, if we are talking about features okay it's a next level so we just not apply this algorithm so it's better approach we can we can do better and the last but not least is testable by design i'd assume that uh every tester ever struggled with uh, some software it cannot be tested easily because of some configurations or sophisticated workflow and we can just break into the middle of workflow to test something and my advice is quite simple we need some uh, additional api for debugging for maintenance just requested uh, you request your developers to create such api if you have to have some configs only in dev environment to get, give you some broad uh, instruments to do testing requested. Uh, if your developers is developing some feature, request some buttons to verify data for these features and verify the fe feature can test itself. So it's really good approach to uh, make all code self-testable. Uh, it's not a unit test, it's uh, testable by design. And uh, in the testable by design, also good approach to request to demand the good login. If you are reading logs, I saw a lot of logs and developers try to put a lot of information there and they can be messy, they can be uh, unstructured, they can be incons inconsistent. So uh, if I see these logs, they are confusing me because it's an issue. It's uh, the violating of uh, quality attribute testability of the application. And if it's uh, uh, make testability worse, it's a big chance that uh, if some issue will happen in production, I will spend more time to investigate it and uh, to find a solution and developers would spend more time to fixing it because we messed our logs. So you make your software in a better way, even uh, even if you are doing some debug stuff like login and uh, config APIs. The next one is development stage. On development stage, uh, we are usually preparing tests like QA testers, it's uh, <laughs> our job. But also I am requiring to create test data on this stage. Moreover, I prepare test data test data not only for myself I prepare test data for our developers and they can put this test data to the unit test uh, and uh, in this way our code is fully tested in advance before it's built with full scope of test design I can imagine I can provide and it's really better than uh, tested later by my own because you know that in my Code of data, uh, I, I have to run it manually, spend some time. And uh, if developer is doing unit tests by uh, their own, 
they can miss some obvious steps or obvious uh, flows. And it's also win-win situation. I help to create better unit test for the developers and developers are doing greater job. So, and another step is prepare environment. So it was also on planning state, but imagine you have your own environment. What all uh, software you need in this environment uh, to test application under test before application is uh, is in this environment to to be tested. If you need to modify this environment, for instance, you need to reduce amount of memory on some server to check some tricky situations. How can I do it? Uh, this is just update of YAML config or should I do it with, together with system administrators? You have to provide some guidelines, some workflows. It's, uh, preparation is not always doing something. It actually can be just planning something, prepare some guidelines, how to do stuff if uh, I will face such situation. It's kind of risk management, but more advanced. And mocks. Uh, in a lot of projects I've seen, uh, appears that uh, software is developed, it's delivered to test environment. Yeah, we're just waiting. We cannot test this stuff because we're missing some crucial part for integration. Okay, and it's a <laughs> it's a, it's the way, but uh, I can just sit in straight and waiting until uh, all software parts appear for integration. I can develop mocks. It's not so complicated as it uh, as you might think about it, and uh, I am act active actively. Mm, developing some mocks for all projects where I'm participating just because it's fun and it's speed up the process. So just think about it. I just uh, faced uh, some tool for e easy uh, mockings and I'm trying to develop my own tool for mockings and it's really, really awesome stuff. And testing. As a software design, all testing intents must be explicit. Testing, you must warn your team that you are going to do some testing. For instance, I am using I, I am going to test how system behaves without the data with a brand new uh, after setup, and I'm going to delete all data. I need to warn my team that hi guys, <laughs> I'm going to delete all data. Are you okay with it? Uh, we have some crucial test data I need to back up in advance, something like that. Uh, if I'm doing some performance testing, automation testing, any kind of testing, uh, make sure the whole team, not only creating, but the whole team is aware what I'm doing. Uh, if you have some issues, blockers, communicate about it ASAP with your team, with the, with the whole team. It's uh, And the blockers, not only I faced some blocker issue in the software, I don't know how to log into FTP server to upload file. Come on, and uh, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Contact your administrator to get. Be afraid to ask. Uh, I saw a lot of situation, uh, especially on meeting, when everybody is sitting and listening for a solution architect or for product owner, and nobody understands what is going on because topic is too complicated. But when architect is asking, everything is every, everything clear? Everybody is nodding. Yeah, everything is clear. But it's a lie. <laughs> if you don't know, if you don't understand, just ask. It's uh, not a be. It's not shame. Not a shame to uh, ask. It's uh, to uh, actually. I, I can accept that I'm a really dumb person. <laughs> I'm not so smart. So if I didn't get some uh, thought, I can just uh, ask to explain it. It it, it would be okay for me. And I always try to provide estimation. Not only I am going to test this, uh, I am going to test this feature, and it would, would take two days to test and half a day to prepare. For another, uh, when they can expect uh, my work is done. And another piece of advice is prepare guidelines. It's good that you know how software is working because you tested it from the very beginning to the 
testing and maybe to the delivery to production. Uh, but uh, just get rid of bus factor. If something bad will happen to you, or you just uh, moving to another project, you are leaving, uh, you are changing your profile of work, uh, make sure the team will handle how to do your job without you, how to uh, transfer your knowledge. We are, are recording video guides. So for every feature I've tested, I recorded video guide. And also for each new feature I am testing, I created daily meeting with my team just to show that I tested this stuff and look how this stuff is working. I won. And uh, all these uh, meetings also recorded so they can get back to them later. And uh, I hope this would be helpful in case that uh, uh, I am not be a part of, of the project anymore. And actually, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening to me. This is QR code for my blog, QRmania. If you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Lucy. Thank you very much. Uh, we are grateful for sharing your profound experience and knowledge with us. And we have a question from the audience. Nadia is wondering, how do you work with emerging technologies in the context of test automation? How do you choose what to adopt? Uh, sorry, could, could you? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, how do you work with emerging uh, technologies in the context of test automation? How do you choose what to adopt? Do you mean uh, emerging like uh, new, new technologies, new test automation tools? Or... Probably. <laughs> okay. Actually, I am reading a lot. I am I have subscribed for Medium. I am reading uh, Do uh, di Software Digest for QAs and for developers and for DevOps. Uh, uh, just to make sure that I know about the latest trends of software development, test automation, operations. And uh, if I read something that intrigued me, I will go to get some additional details and maybe install some software and try it by my own because I like what I'm doing. It's it just interesting. Just uh, if you're interested in uh, Just do it. <laughs> just, just look, look for information. No, no, there is no some special secret ingredient how to do it. Great! Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for answering the question. And Thank now you. we are moving to our next speaker, and I'm glad to welcome Arnika Hrishko, a QA chapter lead at Volvo Group. Uh, who will cover the topic how quality is everyone's resp responsibility. Arnika is QA chapter lead at Volvo Group, world's leading manufacturer of transport. She's an accredited ICTQB trainer and vice president at Polish Testing Board. Arnika, you're welcome. Uh, thanks very much, Jana. Uh, so now uh, it's time for me. Can you just confirm that you uh, can see my screen? Yeah, it's all set. You may start. Oh, okay, uh, great. Actually, we uh, had a lot of great presentation already today. Uh, uh, introduced me a bit. Uh, so yeah, I'm a QA chapter lead at, and test manager. So I double role at Volvo uh, here in Poland. Uh, I'm vice president of the Polish testing board, also cooperating with Dev Challenge and being the media partner uh, for them. Uh, by the way, I encourage you to take part in, in the Dev Challenge because it's that a great, uh, great opportunity to test yourself. And I'm accredited ICQB trainer and in IT testing field uh, over 15 years already. So I have some experience uh, in, uh, in my portfolio. Uh, so the last slide will be here for the whole presentation with actually my key takeaways for you to imprint on that, to remember the message I would like to uh, share with you, that those are the things I would like you to remember uh, from my presentation. 
So the first thing that uh, can be confusing from the start, like many, many people uh, are confusing, are thinking, even in IT, that quality means testing, right? So um, where does it come from? Uh, sometimes it is in the, uh, even the advertisement, you have like job offers, and sometimes even the uh, title states QA tester, a quality assurance tester. So what do you mean? You want quality assurance or you want tester, right? Uh, there are offers for uh, testers, but if you read the description, you have a quality assurance offer, but then from the description, you think it's quality. How is it different? Like testing is mostly ver verification and validation. It's much, it's a part of quality because quality is much, much bigger. It's not only testing, not only verifying uh, the needs of our users. Like the one of the definitions for quality uh, is that quality is the degree to which uh, our products fulfills the needs of our customers. Very wide, very broad, very mm, ambiguous uh, definition, right? Uh, but it is, it is not testing. Testing is only part of the quality. So if quality is everything, right? So like a uh, product can have quality. Quality is something uh, that testers can work on, but not only. It's, as I stated in my, uh, my uh, topic, my uh, topic is everyone's responsibility. Why is that? Because work on quality starts at the very beginning. We had the great first presentation from Natalia that we uh, work starting from the idea, right? Uh, describing the idea, mocking the idea, and doing uh, all that stuff. We had presentation just right now from Alexi saying that we should shift left, that testing can be started very early. Also, quality starts from the very beginning, very idea of the product. Because when we start thinking about our idea, we are thinking how to solve someone's issue, how to solve some problems, how to fulfill their needs and how to do it good. Uh, because I, if I'm thinking about some solution for, I don't know, for some mobile app, I'm starting to think how to make it good, right? How to make it uh, fulfilling, how to make it uh, desirable for, uh, for our customers, for our clients. So I'm already thinking how to do my product to fulfill the needs to do it with quality. Also, to do it with a high quality, we have to keep, we have to stick to all the steps. So actually, Alexi just mentioned, right? We have the roadmap, we have to planning and all that stuff. We have to think about the quality just then, how to do it right, what should be uh, first, what should be next, what steps we should follow, right? We cannot just, okay, we have a great idea, let's do this, right? It will not end up in the good quality if, if we roadmap. So quality starts then, right, with the very beginning of the idea. We have to plan thoroughly. I'm not saying in the very waterfall way, like have whole uh, everything planned to the very, very smallest part, but have the idea what should be our steps, at least what are our uh, milestones, what we'd like to achieve. Uh, one part of the quality is actually stating your goal, right? I have a great idea, but what uh, you will do with this idea? What needs you want to fulfill? Like where, This is where usually the business analysts come in. They're stating the business goals, right? They're stating what's uh, the strategy, what desires of a client or a user we want to fulfill. So we are thinking about quality, so fulfilling all needs of our clients, right? So business analysts, do we need to do in order to fulfill them? What uh, we need to plan, what should be done? 
And the quality also uh, starts with the good communication. Because if you work in IT, you know, clients do not know what they want usually. Uh, this is what uh, you may, after like uh, uh, chat GPT boom, uh, you may uh, saw that there were some uh, memes or uh, the, the jokes that actually AI will not replace us because in order to, for chat GPT or other uh, AI models to work, you have to know exactly what do you want. You have to put the exact prompt stating what do you want. Uh, and usually that's not the case. So to achieve good quality, we have to <clears throat> ask uh, the client in the proper way, what do they want? What needs do they have? Solve their needs, how to fulfill them. It was great as uh, example with Natalia presentation when uh, she was saying that we need to know our client and we need to know who, uh, what are our goals, what are their desires, uh, what should we done. Not only that, there are uh, females in the uh, late 20s, early 30s, but also that they love cats. That's also my <laughs> the same as idea. I have my little uh, helper here with me, my squishy cat. Uh, so... Uh, that I love cats, right? That I live in the village. That uh, what's my uh, desires? What are my uh, goals in life? That also will influence what I'm expecting from certain products, right? So starting with the roadmap, sp starting with the business needs, we starting with the great quality. Then we are going further, right? Uh, we have the business requirements. Maybe we are start uh, to uh, break down them into user stories. If you work with user stories or any requirements, you know that very, very often. Uh, if you have retrospective, for example, and what is the issue uh, often during retrospective? Bad requirements, badly written requirements, uh, requirements that are not easily understandable, right? So we have the word quality in here. So. The requirements has to be written properly. If I had the uh, requirement stating that, that there should be a button, let's say, or something very generic or something very exact, uh, but not describing why it's needed, right? What is the purpose of this part? Most probably I will not... Uh, do not implement uh, this, this element properly. So putting the great requirements, so they are un understandable, but, but by all the people who are using them, meaning testers, developers, architects, is one of the steps of fulfilling and making our product with a great quality. Developers, it was also described uh, in the presentations today, and for sure you know, you can have a good code, you can have a bad code with like, well, how was it, like 15 ifs uh, in the code that you are happy that you tested it, right? But uh, the quality of it, not really good. So we have solid principles, dry principles that Alex uh, described. The uh, purpose of those principles is quality, is to put a good code uh, that is readable, that is easily testable, because then if I'm start Uh, if I receive good quality requirements, good quality code with like unit tests, my testing is easy. I can focus on uh, what to be delivered, not on, on, on some just like trivial things that are wrong. Actually, the, the thing is, I'm, as I said, I'm in testing over 15 years, uh, close to 20 uh, already, and... Um, I was there in the companies that were starting without testers and adding testers or quality assurance in the meantime, right? So you may think that, okay, there was no testers. So the minute the testers were added, actually the quality was through the roof. That's not the case. Why is that? Uh, because uh, the thing is, first thing, 
Testers need to learn, right? Need to uh, make the same acquaintance with uh, uh, everything what's there. But another thing is, uh, it's about the uh, approach because in many, many cases, in my experience, if developers found out we have a tester, what developers did, they stopped care about quality because why to test myself? Why to put a nice code? Why to put all this effort if I have a tester, right? The tester will test everything. It was to the very edge case when uh, I've got one feature to test and nothing was working. When I asked developer, why is that? He said, oh, he was too tired. He didn't want to uh, read the requirements and I will actually report everything that needs to be done in bugs and then he will implement it. So uh, the developer became very, very lazy. I'm not saying is the case with everybody, with every developer, but I saw, saw it with my experience that the developers may become lazy and may think that, okay, quality is not uh, my responsibility anymore because I have a tester right now. No, it's a responsibility from everybody. So we need to learn uh, from each other. We need to develop great product together. So developers also have to take care of the quality uh, and also the maintenance. Uh, right, so you can have a great product, but uh, if product is delivered, it is working, but they some issues occur and you try uh, to report that issues or you want to fix something when already using the product, but it's uh, you do not get any response or uh, it's very, very late. Your experience is... having after delivering the product, if we will not maintain the good rapport with our uh, our users by putting the good service, good maintenance, also we are not maintaining the quality because that also influences quality. And what, uh, why did I put it here that it's not ends with the product? Because if we achieved good quality, great quality even. Uh, this will be remembered even after the thing we developed, it's not used anymore. I have some applications that are not there anymore or uh, they were sold and uh, overtaken by other companies. So these are not the same product anymore, but still I remember them fondly because of the quality they provided. They were so uh, navigation applications, bank before uh, the uh, the banks were merged, right? And they were great. They were really great. Uh, the quality was everything that I needed was there. Everything I wanted to achieve, I could achieve it with ease. Uh, but they are not exist anymore but I still remember them. I still use some of the features I remember from them in the ideas I have for my uh, current project, for the things I'm doing right now. So the quality, if done correctly, stays with people even after our product ends. This is why I'm saying the quality, the work with quality starts from the very idea, from the very beginning, and if maintained on the certain good level, stays with us, stays with the users till the very end of the product or even further. And the uh, third point mentioned here, I already talked uh, a bit about that already. It's quality, it's not, you have a metrics for quality, right? You have definitions for quality, but uh, this Quality is such broad concept. It's actually a mindset, right? It's a process. It's not one, one time, like let's say system testing or UAT testing. It's testing. It's a phase of testing. It's not quality. Quality is a process that starts from the idea and ends at the end of the product, right? So it's the process in which everybody 
takes part because everybody is responsible for quality. It's also a mindset. The developer I mentioned that he, uh, he got a bit lazy because testers are there. Why to test? Why to maintain? If uh, we know, we as a whole development team, uh, whatever you have in your uh, in your team, wants to have a one common goal, and this common goal will be deliver a product with certain quality, meaning great quality or at least good enough quality. So we have the common goal. We want to deliver a product with a great quality. Then it should be in our mindset. You have approaches that you can use, right? There is a Boy Scout rule that if you work on something, leave it better than it, that it was before we were there. So I'm uh, checking, maintaining, uh, let's say, uh, our uh, automation scripts, OK? I can uh, do them a bit uh, better, right? I can propose something. Uh, reviewing everything, you know, the, the starting testing approach. So reviewing stuff, uh, reviewing roadmap uh, ideas. It's also the mindset of the quality. If you want to make things better, then you are putting the mindset of the quality in your team. The great um, approach the, uh, uh, for that is everything, not, not everything, but the uh, methodics, the, the things, uh, the mindsets that come from Japan, you for sure know uh, Kaizen, so the constant improvement, right? Or even Agile, Agile approach, the idea of it is to constantly improve our ways of working. This is why we have retrospectives, right? This is why we work on what went well and to maintain that and what went not very well to improve that. So the mindset for constant improvement is the mindset of quality. In a Japanese culture, this is why they have the Kaizen and all, all other approaches. In their culture, they strive to achieve perfection, which they know already they cannot achieve it. Perfection is not possible, even though you strive to achieve it your whole life. So you have to improve. You know, working in IT, we have to develop. We have to um, improve ourselves constantly. And we have to improve our products, our ways of working. And by working on that, we are maintaining the mindset of the great quality of our products also. Not... Uh, so we can work on the quality uh, of our product and also by us, because I'm sure you know that uh, if you work in a certain way, like your ways of working are fulfilling, are your processes at work, your strategies, roadmaps are in place, uh, then actually the thing that you will produce will be also with a great quality because you like to work on that. You like to improve your ways of working. You, uh, there is a Sunday evening, right? And you are not in the full mood and unhappy because you have to go to work. Maybe you are not in love with your work. I'm not uh, saying about that, but you like, you like to, uh, the challenges, you like your coworkers. If you maintain this mindset, also quality will be there because you will be uh, eager to do something good, not only past the eight hours that you have to the end of the work, right? Uh, so quality, again, is a mindset, is something that we should strive constantly, not only do during the testing. Because, as again, with what I am started with, quality is not only testing, it's only part of it. It's Because of that, everything can be part of it, and it's a process. It's not a one-time uh, thing. And I think that's all I wanted to share. Uh, so, uh, Iana, do we have any questions? Yeah, Arnika, thanks a lot for your presentation. That was really, really inspiring. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on what quality is. And we have... Uh, we 
we actually have a bunch of questions and I would start from the first one. How do you ensure that a quality mindset is incorporated into the entire development life cycle? Uh, depends on how our uh, ways of working look like. Uh, but uh, actually the um, example goes from the top. Uh, so if management, if the project manager uh, is looking for the ways to improve, right? Then people also will work on the ways of improve. One uh, project, we had some issues um, and people were complaining, uh, but only complaining, like uh, the, the example Alexis stated that, oh, your roadmap is, uh, is, is awful or you don't have it, uh, but not stating the um, how to improve it, right? Uh, so in, in, we introduced something like uh, improvement opportunities. So if you could pro you could propose every sprint one improvement opportunity, uh, but with the idea how to solve it. So I see that our tests are not best, right? We are lacking, we are doing badly our automation because the test data is inside them, not outside. So when we are writing, uh, there is a lot. So uh, there was proposition to uh, exclude test data from the uh, test scripts and it was implemented. So we could propose the improvement opportunity that, that we actually could work on that. That, was, that is the exact example, but also leading by example, right? So from the management part, taking care that uh, if something is wrong, that we have time to improve it. And that's how we usually maintain this, this mindset, but also workshop and it's not easy right now when we work remotely, but maintaining good rapport, good atmosphere in the team uh, to, to have this common goal, like workshops to work, uh, work together. Thanks a lot. Uh, the next question is from Roman, who is asking what strategies or methods do you implement to instill the idea that quality is everyone's responsibility within a team or organization? Uh, actually, it's uh, included in the, in the Agile itself. So if you do the Agile the proper way, uh, you know the quality is everyone's responsibility, right? You, uh, in the Agile uh, approach, you have development team. You do not have tester, developer, architect, right? You have development team, so the team who works together, who have, who has common goal like sprint goal and product increment goal. Uh, so usually uh, we use at our company, but uh, like agile or uh, agile coaches who also uh, take care of it, uh, stating that yeah, quality is everyone's responsibility. So even using agile is there. But most approaches are stating that, but it's not. Um, if you try to, uh, for example, go from waterfall to agile or change your approach, uh, it's not easy, the transformation. So you have to actually do that from the very beginning uh, to maintain, uh, maintain. But if you go through all what is there in all the uh, met methodologies and approaches, it's already stated that quality is everyone's responsibility, especially in agile. Thank you. And one more question from Anastasia. What piece of advice would you give to other organizations or leaders aiming to promote a similar culture where quality is considered everyone's responsibility? Uh, as I already stated, like leading by example, uh, if you want to change something, to implement, to put the mindset there, for sure the thing you should strive more because uh, if you just... Uh, it's not just, but if you are a tester with no influence, you can try, you can propose, as Alexi was also stating, if you see something, just tell about it. But you need to have a sponsor, someone from high above that will be supporting that. So find a person in the management, the executive, the high management, that will support that. Without the support from the top, much harder to implement that approach but if the management if the leaders are saying quality is 
our goal, it's our responsibility, it will be much easier to uh, put this mindset in, in, in the people. So find someone who is up there, or if you are a leader, just lead by example and, and show that quality is your common goal and something that you should strive together on. Thank you very much, er Ernika, for your great presentation and for your time. Thank you for joining us today. And now we are moving to our next speaker, last but not least, Roman Yakimchuk, QA practice lead at Ingenica and uh, who will cover the topic test management on real cases. Roman is QA expert with more than 10 years of experience building the QA center of practice from scratch. He's coach in test analysis and exploratory testing, co-founder of Ukraine QA community and QA blog. Roman, you're welcome. Hello, guys. Do you hear me well right now? Because yeah, I can start. switch to. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, test management on real cases, but um, the presentation uh, called a little bit in other way how to build a testing process from scratch in a company with an already existing process. Uh, so let's uh, go in through these slides and I will tell you how to build a great um, processes and uh, I will I will link everything to my uh, experience and uh, after that you can uh, un uh, ask any questions you need to uh, be more um, to receive more answers on your all questions okay let's start first uh, five minutes it will be worrying for me as always but uh, even if I uh, have already have uh, more than five or eight years in uh, conference speeches, I still have a worrying uh, first a couple of minutes. But uh, it doesn't, uh, don't mind on this, uh, please uh, wait five minutes. I, I will show you. Okay, uh, what to do when you come to the project? Uh, well, the testing process uh, has been in place for 15 years, for example, but uh, something is wrong. Uh, imagine the situation when you came to some project as a QA lead or senior QA and uh, there is everything working, but uh, when you go through the first one, two months, you are uh, seeing that something went wrong, uh, something in the processes, something in the in the test documentation or other stuff like uh, requirements are not clear, communication are bad, and uh, people are not uh, understanding each other uh, in the team. So uh, what to do in this way? For example, uh, often people are trying to find uh, an answer on uh, their questions when starting to um, uh, do some actions and nothing uh, is uh, changing. Uh, everything is still uh wor work uh, bad uh, you need to understand the a point uh, every time uh, when you start something on uh, any type of project you need to uh, make a um, start point uh, from where you are starting why do you need to do this because always uh, when you come into the new project you need to understand the processes you need to understand the people you need to understand the uh, purposes and goals which uh, your team are going to. And uh, it's uh, very uh, important to do this. Because uh, uh, when you join some uh, any team, you just start, uh, if you will start uh, testing only from uh, the beginning, they already uh, have their processes uh, as they uh, like. But when you came and see that something is wrong, do not start with the shaming of everybody. Please uh, try to change something as already Arnika and Alexei said that uh, try to do something and to analyze if it's better than it was before. Please um, make a meeting with your project manager and say that you did something and uh, this something is better than previous ones and previous process, the previous bug report, the previous test documentation, 
And uh, in this way, you will say, uh, you will show that you are an expert and you are a corresponding person in the senior level and you can share some your experience and best practices. And uh, if it uh, suits to this team, you can uh, move your team to do more quality. Uh, okay. The next point is where to start the transformation of the QA department in a new company. Uh, so, as I said before, uh, we uh, just need to start from the learning of the everything uh, what, uh, what is the processes, how, uh, what is the flow of uh, moving tasks uh, on the board. Yes, and uh, only after that you can you know, start uh, transform transformation. And you need to understand each person in the team. QA department could be uh, a small uh, riser from one side and another, you, you could uh, face with 80 people in the team of uh, QA persons. And you need to uh, learn each uh, small team, if it's a uh, different teams of uh, development, uh, I mean, five QA on one team, for example, and uh, you just need to understand their vibe because uh, each team, each separate team ha uh, has, um, they, they all, they always have their own pace. Uh, I mean, uh, somebody could uh, do work uh, faster. Somebody could do uh, slowly their uh, tasks. But uh, you need good um, uh, advice, uh, give them advice how to be uh, more faster, how to perform better, how to make a better quality on their project. Uh, so uh, you just uh, don't need to rush uh, everybody. You just need to start uh, from their pace. It's a very important thing. Start from their pace. Uh, if uh, it's uh, uh, if it will start from this, uh, then you could uh, like from uh, small steps start uh, improving their quality, improving their um, uh, like uh, to improve some best practices to integrate uh, your experience and to improve some processes, improve some test documentation creation, to improve communication between the team members, uh, to discuss with them uh, their uh, weakness and changes because it's very important to know, uh, to make a decomposition, to understand the feeling uh, of uh, all uh, company, uh, all team teams at all because uh, if you will start just changing something for from the beginning when you just came to some uh, team uh, it will be uh, a fatal uh, mistake because uh, no, um, nobody like when um, somebody uh, saying you uh, that you're doing your own work that is why please start from the feeling their pace and then uh, from uh, with a small step go to improvement uh, step by step, Im improve one part, another part, improve communication, then improve uh, management process, then improve reporting process, improve. Uh, at least you just need to be uh, agility, as it's uh, modern to say. Yes, you just need to be. Um, uh, you 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 uh, use that person who should be integrated into the team, not the team should be integrated around you. Um, okay, where, where is the middle ground? Start from the scratch or remove the non-working and replace with the working? Uh, it's a very important question. So uh, sometimes uh, we uh, are starting working on some companies where something is working, but uh, better to remove everything and to start from scratch. Uh, I recommend to do this if the process is really worth, uh, if you can analyze and to you know, show the real um, real situation for project manager or for the whole team that uh, the process is a shit, bullshit. Uh, and uh, it's uh, not uh, a good way to continue working with the bad processes, a bad uh, QA process, because uh, if you will continue to work with such a team, uh, you will face with an, uh, again, fatal uh, mistake. Uh, you is responsible for new team if you're a QA lead, for example, and uh, or QA manager. You is responsible for the results, 
and if it was uh, bad results before you come in and if, if you will still continue working in the same bad processes uh, after some uh, six months uh, everybody will say that nothing was changed we still in the bullshit and uh, you need to uh, think about this uh, before you start uh, doing uh, your changes but um, uh, in another way uh, we said about uh, better to start from the scratch and in another way we could uh, think how to we can change something uh, how to we can find the bottleneck and remove them from one bottleneck to another and in this way you will work uh, longer of course but uh, you can change the working process not so stress in, in, in not in such stress because uh, teams uh, don't like a uh, restructurization of all the processes they uh, do have their uh, own like uh, experience with uh, such kind of process uh, which was worked before uh, and you don't need to uh, push on them and to say that everything is shit please do another in another way everything uh, please start from the small steps again you change one part then change another part and change another part and the full process will be changed but not from scratch you just could replace the um, uh, worst things and then uh, like create another another improvement okay how to deal with the team on uh, interaction so that there were no conflict uh, always when you came to some new uh, teams uh, or uh, in the position of senior or any other junior that doesn't matter uh, you just need to uh, deal with uh, everybody in the team because you know, developers uh, don't like when you uh, are creating a lot of bugs for them such kind of developers can say that hey sorry can you create one bug and in this bug uh, put uh, 10 bucks uh, for me it's a pleasure because uh, my manager uh, will say that uh, i am working uh, in bad way uh, <laughs> You could understand these developers, of course, because uh, it's um, like uh, only a point of uh, communication. Uh, for our, uh, as a QA goal, is to make our product uh, with a better quality. So if developer asks you to do in such way, uh, if it's uh, possible to do this, because sometimes we can do this because of you know coverage, aggression issues, and so on, so better to track and uh, or to trace your issues in a separate but sometimes when this really small ui changes create uh, different five cases for example change there and there change there and here and uh, he will or she will uh, fix everything here for one hour and all uh, five bucks will be closed in one minute or uh, in this way uh, it's better to listen to other team members uh, another way when you are working with another case uh, sometimes you have duplication between the team members it's uh, the bad the, like a pity situation because uh, you need to understand that the quality assurance process as everybody says is the process be <laughs> better to prevent issues uh, not to test them after it's uh, the shit happens, as I always like to say, um, when bugs happen. Better to um, prevent all issues, of course, but sometimes um, issue, issues are happening and we need to uh, react on them immediately and uh, to fix them. And uh, imagine the situation when you have 80 uh, engineers, or at least 18, it's also too many. Yeah, and uh, uh, all of them are testing the same thing. Uh, there is no any processes, no any teams separation on features or something like that. And everybody tests the same functionality. And you also, uh, of course, will have a duplication work. How to uh, do uh, uh, better to not face with such situation? First of all, uh, when you have uh, such a big team, you need to communicate to each other on some daily meetings. And we uh, had had uh, QA team dailies after full uh, team daily. It, it uh, passed uh, again five or ten minutes, uh, and all QAs uh, always said uh, that uh, they want to choose that or that part of functionality to test. Uh, this will help you to prevent the situation with duplication. And when you communicate with your team members, you will understand what is 
uh, responsibility for each person. Yes. Uh, in another way, when you do not have such a meeting and or do not have time on this meeting, because a lot of meetings it's also of obvious to say that it's a um, uh, bad situation. Uh, you don't have time to on testing, only meetings and meetings. Uh, you can uh, Slack uh, each person uh, in one channel that there is a new bug happening. And everybody need to understand that uh, if they do not read this uh, chat, they will miss uh, the issue and will uh, create duplication. So it's uh, easy to talk to each person and to communicate uh, to solve all conflicts uh, better to not so solve conflicts but to be like a retro person uh, to make a decision how to prevent the situation in the future like everybody likes from the empty space yes okay the five things is uh, why a roadmap for the testing process uh, for a year or two is important. For example, when you came to a new uh, product, you need to, first of all, to make a decomposition of all the product, and to create a map, to create a timeline of uh, future development, to ask about a roadmap of features. Uh, why do you need this? Uh, you need to understand what is the goals, what are the purposes, when uh, do we have releases in the future, one, two years, and uh, in according to this information, you need to create a special plan, how you could change or how you could influence on the project uh, testing process and how to improve it. Uh, so uh, better to uh, learn everything about the product, to, to communicate with each responsible person and to create such a map. Why do you need to do this and why it's important? Because when, uh, when you start, testing a new product, you just need to understand where you are, I already said. And when you have some uh, something like a plan, a roadmap for a testing process, uh, for, from uh, half a year, year, uh, two year, you will see the results of your improvement. And for example, if in the half of the year, you uh, did everything uh, in the normal pace, as it often uh, likes to say, and nothing uh, was changed in a uh, like better uh, better direction please uh, do a retro and uh, create something uh, like some changes into your plan uh, to make some improvement because if nothing is changing and uh, still the process is a uh, bullshit uh, please uh, re redo your planning and redo a strategy because the strategy influences uh, the strategy in, uh, it's very important in the uh, testing process to say to, uh, to say you how you should uh, get things all things done and uh, to finish everything in time and to uh, have better quality after um, release. Okay, uh, how to motivate teams to achieve their goals? It's uh, my favorite uh, like uh, topic. You just need to be a uh, person, like an individual, as it's uh, like to say, uh, a human, first of all, yeah? And uh, to motivate everybody, uh, you uh, just need to be a psychologist from one point of view. I mean, not psychologist, uh, as a person, uh, like an empath. Uh, em empathy is uh, very important in the team because uh, when you feel emotions of other team members, uh, you just need to understand their, them happier, to help them uh, when needed, uh, to uh, ch challenge them when needed, and uh, to do something to, um, to grow your process, uh, to grow your people around you, to grow the uh, uh, networking, not a, not a networking a relationship between uh, each team member. What, why do we need to do these motivations? Because uh, everybody, uh, first of all, not a software engineer uh, or I mean like development engineer, it's a QA or developer or uh, another uh, person from the development team. Uh, it's a human and uh, everybody has their uh, feelings uh, according to the weather, the family problems, uh, and other things uh, on the traffic jam, 
every everybody uh, everybody could have some to understand each person and uh, to be a, an empath uh, to understand the emotions of people is very important with the help of this, you could motivate people to uh, do um, greater from their like uh, side uh, to show them how to do better the, uh, their to how you can do better your work and to motivate them to do the same thing. On the example, please do everything on the example because a good QA lead, good senior engineer for the juniors and middle engineers should show an example of. Uh, behavior. If your behavior is uh, to do everything clearly and fast and everything with a better quality, uh, everybody would want to uh, do the same things to have uh, less problems. Because uh, when when you see the people who uh, creating a great uh, like strategy, I mean. In the earlier stage, like shift left approach, uh, as uh, Arnika and Alexei said, uh, you just can improve your testing process. And uh, please communicate with each other, motivate each other, communicate uh, on the uh, working uh, like uh, information about the, your job, uh, daily duties. Uh, communicate about your. Uh, interpersonal uh, things uh, which is in common i mean your hobbies uh, other stuff because uh, you already know that uh, team buildings is uh, was created because uh, people uh, are going to some other place not uh, job uh, to do some things together to play some table games to play some i don't know uh, to play some counter strike or how it's called strike ball or to play football because it's a team work. The uh, main thing is build your relationship on the emotional level, on the mental level, and the, on your professional level uh, as an engineer, as a QA engineer, for example. Uh, you would have a great process in all spheres or, uh, on your project and life. Uh, seven. What is a milestone and why it's important? Uh, I already said about this. We need to have a separate, like uh, when you have a, a long roadmap, you just need to have a milestones between uh, in the middle of your uh, long way and to see and analyze how things are going. And if you see something is wrong, please do some changes, improve something and go with a better quality, with a better Pace, with a better motivation, with, with a, I don't know, with a better everything. Eight, is it worth uh, setting deadlines for the real realization of the cooperation? So uh, what about deadlines? Do you like deadlines? Do you like, like deadlines uh, as a sprint? Do you like deadlines as a half of the year and the release should happen? If you do not understand anything, uh, what should be uh, or what might happen in uh, the six months, uh, how would you sign your deadlines uh, on the very beginning? And uh, if you didn't do uh, everything what I said before, didn't do the composition, didn't communicate with all team members, didn't understand uh, before uh, their like um, feelings uh, around everything, everything around the uh, like uh, documentation around the communication in the team uh, you will not pay, uh, you, you will not pass the deadlines but uh, it's okay to say to uh, put some deadlines in your uh, strictly depend from um, your level of understanding of the project I mean, you need to understand how much time you need for testing that or that, how much time you need to fix an issue, how much time you need to retest in something, how much time you need to do regression, uh, in, on which uh, environments you need to test this, on which plot, platforms you need to test this. Everything should be in your mind when you uh, talking about the line with your manager. And of course, the lines is good because whenever people do not have any deadlines, 
<laughs> they will never finish your product. Your uh, project will be always be like in progress. But the deadlines should be correct. Uh, you should not do uh, something like an uh, unreal estimated uh, deadlines. I mean, uh, to do the things for the one month, it's uh, not possible to do in uh, one week. And uh, when when people say that we will give you uh, some an, an energetic drink, uh, please do this for one week, never uh, say that okay, because and um, uh, it's uh, not problem in like uh, the. Uh, that uh, it's uh, possible to do with uh, 24 hours uh, working seven days per week. It's a problem in your uh, mental health or in your, at least uh, in general health, because uh, when you can do something uh, in like uh, faster than other people, please uh, think about your problems. Think about something that could happen in any time. For example, death of your uh, best friend uh, in the worst case. Uh, at least uh, firing of your uh, developer who was the best in your team. And it could uh, influence on your emotional uh, health. It could influence on your uh, work, uh, like um, in your work pace, uh, how quickly you will respond to any task and uh, you just need to be more um, you, you you just need to use risk uh, analysis and uh, risk based approach to uh, put everything uh, like in this estimation to make your deadlines not very stressed because if you uh, try to finish everything uh, very fast uh, you will finish everything not at a time okay what we can promise managers and what we shouldn't tell them. We can promise that uh, we could do some part of job. Uh, I recommend you to do at least a plan for 100% to promise, uh, for example, on six manager. Because if you promise for 100% your plan, uh, make sure that uh, you will have enough strength uh, to finish this uh, at a time. Better to promise for 60% and to do more on 40% uh, to make th things like uh, 150% and it will be better for your manager. Don't uh, promise them that you do will do everything you uh, if it's even possible to do. If you will do everything uh, and it will be with the best quality. Uh, and uh, you do, shouldn't tell them uh, everything. You shouldn't tell them all possible cases and strategies and risks and any kind of uh, experience you will grow from the dev challenge. Yes, uh, after the championship and after the championship, you will better test everything and you will improve all the testing process. You shouldn't uh, do like, um, shouldn't tell them everything you could do. And then, then show results, then tell something, and then uh, do not realize all your ideas. And uh, how to show uh, progress for a year of work done? Of course, uh, as always, we need to present uh, uh, reports when we do some hard work, when we do some medium work or low, uh, uh, low uh, pace, as it uh, says, uh, job. You still need to prepare some progress. And uh, what you need to remember is that test documentation, uh, test reports, uh, it's everything you need to have in, uh, to handle with, uh, when you are uh, working in, in different like, uh, projects. Because without any documentation, without any test reporting, without any like uh, paperwork, you, uh, you will not uh, answer on are going. What is the results of testing? Uh, how many time we need to finish this? Or uh, what uh, on your mind is the quality of our product? So please do a reporting, make a notes, make an improvements list. If you, even if you don't improve any 
anything during the release, please present this list of your improvements to your manager and say that I have a lot of improvements to do. If we will do this, we will uh, do optimization of our process. We will do a better quality of our product. We will do a great, a better work and uh, everybody will be happy. Thank you. Uh, I would like you to re uh, recommend my uh, courses, which you can finish uh, and my Telegram channel. If you want to join, I'm writing a lot about test management. Webinars, please join me in all the networks. Thank you. Any questions, Jana? Thank you, Roman. That was a really great presentation. Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. So the first one is from um, Anastasia. What advice would you give to other organizations or leaders aiming to promote um, a similar culture where quality... Oh, that was the question to Ernika, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the question to you is what metrics or key performance indicators, KPIs, do you consider essential for assessing the success of test management in real cases? First of all, we need to remember that uh, together metrics, uh, uh, it's uh, important when something is bad. Because to make a matrix and to you know, like um, measure uh, everything possible, like uh, uh, amount of issues, uh, the developers like uh, bad work, we could do everything. We could measure everything. But uh, the, be the best thing you need to remember, please, uh, better do not um, gather like metrics, better to analyze a progress uh, wi within according to that st strategy and plan. So you don't need a lot of metrics. You just need to be sure that your plan is up to date. Your plan is uh, highly uh, received several times before approved and everything will be good if you will do everything according to your plan and strategy. To gather metrics is good, but you could gather something like amount of issues on the production, how many issues are going to the, uh, <clears throat> the time of response from the developer to a tester after you created and, and block uh, when uh, the team in general uh, i mean the, the medium time uh, how quickly team creates the test cases i mean the 10 test cases per one hour or five test cases per an hour why do you need this uh, with the uh, with the help of this uh, matrix you could understand the pace of your team what i already talked about and uh, do not do a lot of metrics metrics don't need to be like uh, created if the team working great do better your duties do better your work and responsibilities and you will never need any metrics thank you Thank you. And the next question is from Christina, who is asking what advice or insights would you offer to individuals or teams aiming to improve their approach to test management based on your real case experiences? Uh, what I... From the 2012 uh, working with exploratory testing and from the 2015, I'm working as a test analyst. I'm advising to analyze a product and uh, beginning from the decomposition, creating a lot of mind mapping, mind maps uh, to uh, work with the impact analysis to understand uh, what is the dependencies between the uh, components. Uh, do first the exploratory testing and then do script testing. Do not uh, uh, like, do not go analyze as a real user how to work with the system. Uh, ignore the functional like um, things like test cases and checklists. Uh, uh, write your document documentation, but again, do not do a lot of documentation. Please use test analysis to optimize all your test cases. Uh, use combinatorial techniques like pairwise domain analysis, uh, equivalent process partitioning, 
It's a simple technique which everybody know, but nobody use. Please do this and you will have a better quality on your product. Came to my courses. I will show you how. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Roman. We are truly grateful for your time and knowledge. And our big thanks to each and every speaker for sharing your expertise and inspiring our audience today. We are also grateful to all the participants who joined us today. That was Dev Cycle Day, series of six online speeches by leading experts and Dev Challenge judges covering all stages of the development cycle at the part of Dev Challenge. We encourage you to stay connected with the Dev Challenge on social media platforms such as Facebook, LinkedIn, Telegram, and Instagram, where we will be broadcast the opening of the final tomorrow, as well as the Dev Challenge Friends Day on Sunday. Looking forward to welcoming you tomorrow at the official opening of the 20th anniversary season of the largest championship for IT specialists in Europe, Dev Challenge. See you there. <laughs>